live. Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. We're going to reconvene the regular Board of Education open session at 7.08 p.m. Thank you for your patience uh, while we are getting ready for this meeting. I'd like to introduce uh, Brad Oaks Principal, Dr. Janie Nichols, to introduce the student who will be doing the pledge tonight. Thank you. Good evening, Board President Trevanti, board members, Dr. Trozian, cabinet, and the Monrovia community. It is my great pleasure to be here with you tonight. And with me this evening is Moses Brown. He's a fifth grader in Mrs. Drow's class, and he will be leading us in the flag salute. Moses is an excellent representation, representative of our Brad Oak community. He has a positive attitude and consistently demonstrates a growth mindset. Moses is hardworking, creative, and exemplified what it means to roar. And for those of you in our audience who do not know what ROAR stands for at Brad Oaks, it means that we are respectful, we're on task, we have our attitudes in check, and we are responsible, all of which Moses demonstrates. The Brown family is a wonderful example of our MUSD community at large. They currently have a high schooler, middle schooler, and three Bobcats. You will always see them looking out for each other and leading by example, which is a microcosm of the spirit you will find in our larger Brad Oaks family. Moses, please unmute yourself and lead us in the flag salute. Right hand over your heart. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for richest stand one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Very well done, Moses. Thank you very much for being here tonight and for being such a great student. Thank you, um, Dr. Nichols, for, for um, having uh, Jordan, or I'm sorry, Moses join us tonight. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'd like the record to reflect all board members are present and everyone is in their seats. Uh, we did hold a closed session this evening and we took no reportable action. Uh, Dr. Terosian, are there any changes to the agenda? Yes, President Trevanti, uh, we would like to move consent item one, the contract for positive behavior interventions and supports, otherwise known as PBIS, to action directly preceding uh, the action items within uh, the Business Services Department. We'd also like to move consent item nine, uh, board policy 5144 on discipline, to action directly preceding pending board issues. And we'd like to move action item seven, the board discussion to rename the Monrovia High School Wellness Center to be the first action item following consent. Okay, I've noted the changes, but uh, definitely keep me straight, uh, Dr. Terzian, since we do have multiple changes and I know you're trying to keep me on my toes and that's okay. <laughs> All right, we'll move on to um, approval of the minutes. We had a regularly board uh, scheduled board meeting on February 24th. We had a special board meeting on March 2nd and another special board meeting on March 3rd. And if it's okay with everybody, can we just do take care of this in one motion? So moved. Second. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. And we'll do one roll call. Ms. Huff, please. Board member, board member Hammond? Yes. Board member Anderson? Yes. Board member Golar? Yes. Board member Lockerbie? Yes. Board President Trevanti? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Ms. Huff. We'll move on to recognitions and communications. The Board of Education and the Chamber of Commerce would like to congratulate the following employees on being recipients of Monrovia Unified School District's Employee of the Month for the month of March. We have Cheryl Clapsaddle, Clerical Assistant, Brad Oaks. Jill Levengood, Teacher, Brad Oaks. Tom Bogdan, office manager, Wild Rose, and Sharon Noggle, teacher of Wild Rose. So first I'll bring back Dr. Janie Nichols to um, speak to their achievements. Thank you very much. I am so happy and excited to share about our employees of the month. And I think um, 
I'm going to start with, I'm not sure what the order is, but I'm, I'm going to start with Miss. Oh, there you go. That's what I need to know. Thank you, Shoshana. I'm going to start with Mrs. Clapsaddle. She has worked in the school office at Brad Oaks for over 20 years. And as the cl office clerk, she is one of the first people you meet when you come into the office and she greets you with a smile. Mrs. Clapsaddle. Saddle Cheryl answers and supports countless inquiries from parents, families, teachers, as well as a variety of visitors who reach out to the office. She is one of the most patient, kind, and helpful people you will ever meet. Even if she doesn't know the answer, she will find a way to get that answer to you. And she will definitely return a response and, give, and call you back as fast as possible. Regardless how, how busy the office gets, Cheryl remains unruffled and is calm and still has time and ways to ask, how are you or can I help? And oftentimes that's when we need the kindest and nicest voice possible and that's Cheryl. We are so fortunate to have um, Cheryl at Brad Oaks. Cheryl, thank you for all that you do. I know you're here, I saw your name. Your flexibility and your positivity, positivity certainly brightens everyone's day. Thank you so much, this is well deserved. All right. And next we have Mrs. Levengood. Oh, I didn't get the, no. Oh, other take Miss. Are we okay? It would be great to be able to hear from Ms. Clapsdale. She's willing. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mrs. Mrs. Clapsdale, are you, can you unmute? I'm here. I'm here. Oh, I'm, I'm so proud. Uh, Privileged to be here and um, honored to receive this award. Um, all my 23 years, I've enjoyed my job. I'm looking for, look forward every day to come and work with a fabulous staff and great kids. Uh, it's a real honor. I want to thank everyone for voting for me. <laughs> thank Congratulations. you, Ms. Thank you so much. And Ms. Clapsaddle, I have to say I am so impressed because you were so nervous about the technology tonight. You did it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks so much. Thank you. All right, and now on to our certificated um, employee of the month, Jill Levengood. Mrs. Levengood has been a teacher at Brad Oaks for over 20 years, has taught most grade levels, and is currently our fabulous, outstanding interventionist. The role of an interventionist is challenging without being in a pandemic you throw in this past year is a huge task that only Jill can do so well at Brad Oaks. And we thank you for that. She's mastered it and made it look so easy. She is extremely flexible, incredibly organized, and is a creative problem solver. She perseveres, everyone. She will not, she's relentless at it. She will find a way to help students. And I just love that heart of hers. She monitors all grade level progress and needs for the students she supports. She is constantly switching between grade levels and, and students all day long, making it look effortlessly and, and fluid. Um, she's, she's just masterfully doing that. You would swear she was doing Zoom lessons you know, prior to the pandemic. One of the most exceptional trait that Mrs. Levengood has is that she is always positive and willing to help in any way possible. And, that is not an exaggeration. She never flinches when she's asked to go above and beyond in any and all areas of our needs at, at Brad Oaks. She's invaluable to our students, to teachers, family, and to me. That, this part, I, I was talking to, or texting back and forth with Jill last night, and I have to mention this last little bit. Throughout her tenure at Brad Oaks, Mrs. Levengood has had a lasting impression on our Brad Oaks family. She has made lifelong connections with them and her students, and she dearly treasures. You could just hear her passion and joy she gets from the connections she's made throughout the years with the families at Brad Oaks. Jill, we thank you for all that you do for our students and community. This is so well-deserved once again. Thank you very much. All right. Congratulations, Jill. I don't see her name, Jill. I, I hope you're there. Do I see her name there? I don't see her name either. It doesn't look like she's in. Okay, I bet she's with you too. <laughs> so you're hearing me, Jill. Well, congratulations. <laughs> well deserved. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nichols, for being here and presenting Thanks. yours. And now I'll introduce the Wild Rose principal, um, Paige Ramos. 
Good evening, President Trevanti, members of the board, Dr. Trosi and cabinet and community members. My name is Paige Ramos and I'm the proud principal of Wildrose School of Creative Arts. This evening, I'm delighted to be here to introduce our employees of the month. It would be unfair for me to share about this dynamic duo without sharing a spotlight on their superstar status at school during the pandemic. Together on campus, Sharon and Tom are known to some as the self-proclaimed The Band B Minus. Every morning they meet before school to practice new songs with Tom on guitar and Sharon singing along. They work together daily to create memorable morning announcements for our students. As a school, we are incredibly thankful for their creative efforts. Their commitment to putting a smile on everyone's face doesn't go unnoticed, and I'm extremely grateful to work with both of you, and this recognition is well-deserved. First up, we have our Classified Employee of the Month, Mr. Tom Bogdan. Mr. Bogdan has been the office manager at Wild Rose for three years. He's extremely kind, understanding, and welcoming to everyone he comes in contact with. Our staff and families continuously show their appreciation for his commitment to the success of Wild Rose students. He is always willing to lend a helping hand and is always uh, displaying a calm demeanor. This demeanor is contagious. Mr. Bogdan helps to organize and manage our grab and goes, offers technology support and so much more. There's no job too big or too small that Mr. Bogdan isn't willing to help out with. He goes above and beyond to volunteer his time for Wild Rose, even outside of his workday. Mr. Bogdan is an active member of our PTA and supports all of their fundraising efforts. There's nothing that can hold Mr. Bogdan down, even in a worldwide pandemic. Most recently, Mr. Bogdan was recognized by AXA as one of the magnificent Monrovians. Mr. B, thank you for being the heart of Wild Rose. Congratulations, Mr. Bogdan. He's on here, Mr. B. Hi, thank you so much for this honor. It's wonderful to receive it. I love my staff. I share this award, uh, this honor with my family and uh, for whom truly I would not be here if not for them because my kiddos went to Wild Rose. I was a PTA guy. Then I was on the playground. Now I'm in the office, keeping on, keeping on. I love the arts. I love our school. Thank you so much. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. All right, next up, our certifi certificated employee of the month is Sharon Noggle. Ms. Noggle is the intervention specialist at Wild Rose. She has worked in Monrovia Unified School District for 25 years, including the last four years at Wild Rose. As the intervention specialist, she is tasked with differentiating instruction to support the needs of students. On a daily basis, she is also extremely supportive to our staff as an eye coach to assist with technology and other related support. However, one of her greatest passions is working with our students on Disney musicals and schools. She has helped direct plays such as Aladdin, 101 Dalmatians, and Lion King. Being on the stage is one of her favorite components of working in the creative arts school. From day, on, day one, she has been an amazing co-pilot, teaching me the ways of Wild Rose, and I truly appreciate her. She is always willing to support my ideas and go above and beyond for our Wild Rose family. Ms. Noggle, thank you for being a key player at Wild Rose. Congratulations. She's here as well. Thank you. This is such a great honor, and I just love Wild Rose School of Creative Arts and Monrovia Unified School District so much. This has been a very challenging year, but our colleagues, including our new principal, Mrs. Ramos, have made it actually fun and worthwhile. So thank you so all so much for this award. Wonderful. Congratulations. And thank you for being here tonight, and thank you, Ms. Ramos, for presenting um, all four candidates were very deserving of this, and, and you are rock stars in our district. So thank you very much. All right, moving on on our agenda, um, we have added a new agenda item from now until the end of the school year, and it's to recognize our seniors, our class of 2021, and their commitments. And normally, or under normal circumstances, 
there would be lunchtime activities. There, it would be posted to social media when one of our seniors committed to a college, a, a trade school, or military branch. Um, but we thought that we'd take it up another step um, during this time and recognize them during our board meetings. So tune in every board meeting for this section. And I will go ahead and uh, hand it over to Vice President Celine Lockerbie to read the list this, this time around. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you so much for creating this additional opportunity for us to celebrate our students and our, uh, our graduates. So these are um, uh, students from Canyon Oaks High School and Mountain Park School who have committed to joining the below colleges or trade schools. Jose Alvarado Contreras, Citrus College. Jose Castaneda, Citrus College. David Cervantes, Pasadena City College. Angel Chacon Luzardo, Citrus College. Jesse Chavez, Citrus College. Justine Delgado, Cal State LA. Kayla Lawson, Citrus College. Amber Leon, Citrus College. Krista Lopez, Barber School. Jeremy Robinson, Pasadena City College. Imoni Waiters, UEI slash MCIS. From Mountain Park, the commitments and the students are Maria Bautista, Citrus College. Kashai Boone, Citrus College. Alexa Cisneros, Citrus College. Casey Fernandez, U.S. Army. Natalie Jimenez, Citrus College. Haley Kenyon, Citrus College. Andrew Limbach, Pasadena City College. Brendan Miller, Citrus College. Jessica Perez, Citrus College. And finally, Madeline Santana, Cosmetology School. Congratulations to all of our seniors um, for their commitments. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Lagerby, for reading those. Yes, congratulations to you, are, to you all. You are to be commended, and the board wishes you all the best on your future endeavors. Wonderful. So I look forward to the next meeting where we'll have um, even more names. Thank you, Ms. Huff, for um, putting up those slides. And next we have uh, board member reports. And I, I do have a report. Um, first thing I wanna say is uh, thank you to, to our community, our parents, our teachers, and everyone that has taken the time to submit emails, text messages, phone calls, other messages um, to board members and um, you know, providing your concerns, your thoughts, uh, your questions. And uh, we've worked very diligently this, this past week in responding to all those. And if you received a response from me, it was on behalf of the board. So again, um, it, it makes our responsibility easier when we, you know, when we hear from you. So thank you again for, for all of those. Um, I'd also like to report on last Thursday, Santa Fe Computer Science Magnet School held a drive-through open house. And the theme was the 50s in rock and roll with vintage hot rod cars, shakes made out of balloons and teachers with leather jackets, shades and poodle, poodle skirts and the iconic ponytails. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Thank you, Dr. Zamaripa and the entire Santa Fe staff for being so creative and making things fun for the students and their families. I was there along with Dr. Terosian, Dr. Jackson, the first half and board member Jennifer Anderson was there for the second half. Great to see the students again. And even though I couldn't see their smiles because, because of masks, you just know they were smiling. Jennifer, um, would you like to add something since you were there also? Yes, thank you, Board President Travanti. Um, having been a parent of students at Santa Fe for eight years and never missing their open houses and their, their grilled cheese and hot dogs that they're famous for, it was just an unbelievable thrill for me to be able to go back and witness the enthusiasm and the passion that all of the staff 
um, brings to our, our campus every day. Um, it was wonderful see, to see the students, although I didn't recognize very many of them because my kids moved on a little bit, but it, it was truly um, just a fabulous way to kick off our open house season. And I'm, I'm so um, grateful and I feel so privileged to have, have joined in. So thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, no other board reports. So we'll move on to the student board member report. Um, Ellie, are you in the house? I, I believe that Ellie is not here. I have her report and I'm happy to read it on her behalf, President yes, Trevanti. Yes, please. Please, Dr. Terosian. Good evening, President Trevanti, members of the board, cabinet, friends and family of the Monrovia community. Ellie is glad to report that the staff at Mountain Park School and Canyon Oaks High are carefully and quickly and strategically planning for a return to school. They are grateful to see the light at the end of the tunnel and embrace the feedback and impact and input of all stakeholders during this process. As you know, they have a small campus where Canyon Oaks students can soon attend following all health and safety protocols. For those students attending Mountain Park School, not much will change except for the weekly teacher appointments may be done on campus now in addition to the virtual meetings and tutoring sessions. Mountain Park also provides flexibility for students who prefer either short-term or long-term remote learning with a home-centered approach void of daily Zoom meetings. As she shared in her last report, Mountain Park allows parents, families, and students the opportunity to achieve their individual academic goals by customizing their schedules to meet the needs that their jobs, childcare situations, and other familial obligations demand as a result of the pandemic. This learning model, along with the grace and flexibility our staff members provide, their staff, staff members provide, has allowed many, like Ellie, to continue to thrive as we navigate, navigate through these unprecedented times. If you have any questions about the options about our alternative schools, please feel free to reach out to the administrators there, uh, Mr. Furtig, and or Mr. McKendrick. Thank you, Dr. Terosian, and thank you, Ellie, for sending in your report. Um, on to the public comments section. The Board of Education encourages public participation and invites you to share your views. Um, public comments for items not on the agenda. Ms. Huff, are there any? Uh, yes, Board President Trevanti, uh, we have quite a few tonight. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm going to summarize um, or only read, you know, maybe the first one or two paragraphs of each of them before moving on. Um, but they will be forwarded to the board following this meeting. Uh, the first public comment comes from Heather Castle. Uh, Ms. Castle writes, good evening. Once again, I wanted to say thank you for the brain power, mental gymnastics, and emotional bandwidth the reopening task force and the board has given in order to reopen our schools. I again want to stress that both myself and our and countless other parents in Monrovia Unified want to ensure that our teachers have the best chance of success as we look to going back to the classroom. I'm curious if Monrovia Unified will take a note of LAUSD and extend reopening until all teachers can be vaccinated. Um, she continues on, but I'm going to stop there. Uh, the next public comment comes from Jordan Bolt. Jordan writes, uh, good evening. I know there is a lot to consider, so I will try to make my question concise. It is difficult to develop a model without knowing more current numbers of what families are planning to do. We have been told that MUSD is planning on roughly two thirds of students returning to school. I have three children at Monroe and all my kids' classes have 20 to 22 kids. Two thirds of this number would be approximately 14 students. And if there are 14 kids or less that are in hybrid learning, could teachers then just have either all those kids come two days a week and focus on Zooming with all the kids the rest of the week? Jordan continues, but I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, the next public comment comes from Cheryl Kendall. Cheryl writes, what is the protocol for passing periods? Who will so supervise and how will the students be directed in order to maintain social distancing? How long will the passing periods be? 
If teachers need to clean off desks, they need to be given time to do this. How will the different classes be excused when the period is over? Cheryl also continues, but I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, the next public comment comes from Mark Lovers. Mark writes, dear school board members, one of the chief concerns that I have heard com heard come up from members of our staff, certificated and classified, is the issue of childcare. There are a lot of district employees who are at home with their families and have been the primary child care provider for their children during the pandemic. What plans does the district have in place to help facilitate the needs of those who cannot return to their school site because they do not have any child care during this unprecedented time? And Mr. All right, thank you. Uh, we apologize for those viewing from home. Apparently we had a technical difficulty and our feed froze. I do wanna let you know that we did stop. We did not continue with the public comments, so you did not miss anything. Ms. Huff, if you could please repeat that last one that referred to the quality of time and then continue from there. Thank you. Um, so Mr. Lovers, you would like for me to reread that? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, so Mark Lovers uh, writes, uh, Dear school board members, one of the chief concerns that I have heard come up from members of our staff, certificated and classified, is the issue of child care. There are a lot of district employees who are who are at home with their families and have the primary and have been the primary child care provider for their children during the pandemic. What plans does the district have in place to help facilitate the needs of those who cannot return to their school site because they do not have any child care during this unprecedented time? And I believe that's where I stopped. Okay. Okay. Yes, um, thank you. The next public comment comes from Mitzi Avila. Mitzi writes, um, I have many concerns surrounding the reopening of schools. One is with the quality of time that has been that has been given to, comp to comprising a new hybrid schedule that needs to take into account the needs of students, teachers, staff, and parents. I feel like dismissing a model that was crafted over a long period of time and creating a new one with such short notice is not only unfair, but compromising. I too want schools to reopen. However, I want it to be done in a well thought out manner and not in a rushed, let's get it done manner. And Mitzi does continue, but I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much, Ms. Avila. Uh, the next public comment comes from Sheila Reed. Uh, Sheila writes, I have three main concerns. They are one, ventilation. The windows to my class are sealed shut. I cannot leave the door open because I have kids that could elope from class. Two, restroom hygiene. Will restrooms be sanitized after use? Three, will students be escorted to and from restrooms following mitigating guidelines regarding social distancing, distancing and hand washing? Thank you, Sheila Reed. Thank you, Ms. Reed. Uh, the next public comment comes from Yvette Romero. Yvette writes, Dear board members, could you please address the following questions and concerns at tonight's board meeting regarding the secondary school plan to return to school. Currently, my projector is on a cart in the middle of the classroom. My laptop will need to connect to the projector along with a second screen and a camera. If the projector was mounted on the ceiling and connected wirelessly, then I can sit at my desk away from students. 
The technology setup I had before distant learning is not feasible with current technology needs. And Ms. Romero does continue on for quite a bit, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Ms. Romero. Um, the next public comment comes from Alfred Cagliari. I apologize if I mispronounce your name, Alfred. Alfred writes, good evening. I would like to express my concern over how the process of reopening schools is commencing. I want my kids back in school, but I also want them back in school safely through a well thought out deliberate plan. After watching the meeting last week, I was concerned how the plan that was presented was rejected without any questions being asked about that plan. I was not a fan of the entire plan, but some of it had merit. I am sure the task force had solid reasons for the plan they created, but not once did I hear any discussion about those reasons. The parameters some of you gave, excuse me, I'm gonna back up. The parameters some of you then gave seem to be more about providing daycare than education. No other surrounding district for obvious reasons is asking their students and teachers to return to school from eight to three even at two days a week. And Mr. Cagliari does continue on, um, but it is very lengthy, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you for your comments, sir. Um, the next public comment comes from Barb Allstadt. Barb writes, Dear board members, the term live streaming or simultaneous teaching keeps being mentioned and as, as something the school board wants and is meeting with grave resistance from teachers. During the school board meetings, as well as in the task force meetings, not one member has asked or engaged in a discussion of why it's meeting with resistance, just merely demanding that teachers do it in order to open schools. Teachers simultaneously teaching, students in person, as well as in a virtual world would neither help with acquiring the academic standards, nor will it improve their social emotional health. That social, social emotional piece, that team building component that teachers have worked tirelessly to forge this year will suffer irreparable damage. And I'd like to discuss why and Barb continues on for very much longer, but I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Ms. Alstead. <clears throat> uh, the next public comment comes from Shannon Johnson. Dear MUSD board members, thank you for the time to read this email. I am a proud product of the Monrovia Unified School System. I have taught here in Monrovia for the past 29 years. I've seen many board members, administrators, and superintendents come and go over the years. Monrovia Unified has always strove to ensure a quality education for our students, as well as keeping a focus on their social and emotional needs. As our community begins to open up, Monrovia will need to continue to serve our families in providing whatever resources we have available. As the district looks at reopening our schools, there is no doubt that MUSD should continue along this same path. However, after the last school board meeting, too many questions were left unanswered. Something is missing as we discuss various hybrid models and schedules. Questions regarding student supervision, breaks and recesses, as well as teacher planning and prep time. The issues of planning and preparing for two completely different types of teaching, each requiring their own materials and skill sets on both the students and the teachers part is a daunting task to think about. And Ms. Johnson does continue on, but I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. And the next public comment comes from Tim Castro. Tim writes, hello, MUSD school board members. I am a parent of a fifth grade student, as well as the husband of a current MUSD teacher. I am planning on keeping my child at home for the remainder of the school year. What will be done to ensure that remote learners will be given the same amount of attention and instructional hours as in-school learners? While I understand there are financial incentives to starting in-school learning as soon as possible, I ask that it not start until after spring break. This will give teachers and parents more time to prepare adequately for the return of the students to the classroom. Thank you, Tim Castro. Thank you, Ms. Cast Mr. Castro. 
Uh, the next public comment comes from Desiree Harbo. Desiree writes, Board President Travanti and members of the board, in regard to the board's considerations to reopen schools, please do not miss the forest for the trees by considering only a few parts of this important step. It is the minutia that will make or break us and garner the support of the MUSD community or lead families to look elsewhere to educate their children. The process matters. How the board chooses to discuss working through the reopening of schools matters. This community is engaged and we are listening. Sincerely, Desiree Harbo. Thank you, Ms. Harbo. I'm gonna pause one second, I'm a little thirsty, hold on. Take your time, Ms. Huff. Okay. Um, the next public comment comes from Tanya Sherman. Tanya writes, uh, dear, Port, dear Board President Travanti, Board Members Dr. Therosian and Cabinet, we are writing to you with our concerns about the newly updated hybrid model <clears throat> and, it is, and its impact in our ability to teach effectively. We have been teaching in Monrovia for over 20 years each. In the current hybrid model, our students will have less interaction with their teacher and peers. The current bandwidth at our site cannot sustain both students and teachers being on a Zoom at the same time. Therefore, a barrier is created. The two groups cannot interact or hear each other. So any questions or comments made by the students will have to be repeated by the teacher before it is answered because one group will not have the context to understand. Because of the barrier created by not being able to Zoom together, there will be less instructional time for students. Each lesson will have to be taught twice, once to the students in the room, and then repeated digitally for the students at home. This creates less instructional time and less interaction with the students in the room. And Tanya does continue on, but I am going to pause there. Thank you, Ms. Sherman, for your comments. Uh, the next public comment is an anonymous one. Um, it reads, uh, Dr. Therosian, School Board President Trevanti, members of the board. I, like many of my fellow students at Monrovia High School, have been hearing more and more about the possibilities of returning to school in April under a hybrid, under a hybrid model. And rumored details of such a plan have been circulating among students and teachers alike. <clears throat> Regardless of the details of a hybrid model, I plan on attending in person in whatever capacity I can, but I completely understand and respect those who wish to stay at home. Despite this, I have some concerns about the plan and it's in its current condition, as well as some questions. First, I have been, I've been informed that in-person classes will essentially be an in-person viewing of our teachers, teaching to students at home via Zoom. Teachers will teach their Zoom lectures to those who wish to remain distance, while those who have elected to return to school will receive the same Zoom-friendly lecture. And um, Anonymous does continue on for very much longer, but I'm going to stop there. Thank you for your comments. <clears throat> And the next public comment comes from Natalie Harrison. Uh, dear board members, uh, could you please address the following questions and concerns at tonight's board meeting regarding the secondary school plan to return to school? Will extra masks be ordered by the district for teachers to give to students that forget their masks so that we can be so that we all can be protected should a student forget their mask at home? What will happen if a student <coughs> or multiple students come to school and then test positive for COVID within a day or two of being at school or while at school. What rules will be in place regarding interaction among students? Will lunch be provided? What rules will be in place during lunch at the middle and high schools? And she has uh, quite a few further questions. I'll, I'll end with this last one. Will students have access to Chromebooks on campus at our middle schools and high schools so that we can get, so that we can guarantee one-to-one -one technology instruction? Thank you, Ms. Harrison, for your questions. 
Um, the next public comment comes from Paige Chamberlain. Um, Paige writes, I attended the first elementary school task force webinar <clears throat> held February 25th. Uh, hold on, let's make sure I'm in the right place. Yes, I also read through the email sent out by the superintendent's office on March 5th containing an update regarding the reopening of elementary schools. In both the webinar and the email, priority number one, in which no wiggle room could be made, was maintaining current teacher-student relationships, meaning no child <clears throat> will be assigned a different teacher at this point in the school year. Because of this, the first six most common ways in which kids are attending school across, across the country were flat, flatly rejected. For that one reason alone, I do not understand why the highest priority at this time is a child or teacher making a change. Granted, it is not ideal, but it hardly feels like the most disruptive thing happening in anyone's lives right now. If kids can handle the uncertainties of a global pandemic, disruptions to parental income, housing changes and uncertainties, isolation, changes in daycare situations and supervision, then surely they can handle a change in teacher. If it means they can have one thing back in their life that is normal, attending school and seeing friends and classmates on a regular basis. And Paige does continue, but I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Ms. Chamberlain. Uh, the next public comment comes from MTA president, actually it comes from, from a few people. So it comes from the MTA executive board, uh, Ann Battle, Randy Medina, Katie Chick, Sandy Duff, Robin Chica, Doug Schmidt, Jen Mata, Terry Espinoza, Rebecca Alarcon, and Anthony Carlson. Uh, there is one other group, sorry. And the negotiations team, Ryan Minlove, David Ross, Mark Lovers, Stephanie Sparks, and Paul Flores. And Ms. Battle, or the group, writes, Good evening, board members, cabinet members, and Dr. Therosian. Many teachers were extremely concerned about the discussion and subsequent re rejection of the elementary school hybrid model at the last school board meeting. Many noted the fact that the model carefully crafted over many months by our representative groups, including teachers, parents, and administrators was seemingly brushed aside as not meeting the needs of parents. Board members then began a discussion of what they hoped would be the MUSD plan and that their wish was, was that the time frame would closely mirror March it, excuse me, I'm gonna read that, uh, I'm gonna start over. Board members then began a discussion of what they hoped would be the MUSD plan and that their wish was that the time frame would closely mirror last March's time schedule before the pandemic hit. To teachers, this seemed like a full return to school. And given the constraints provided by the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, this is not possible with class sizes set at 12 students per co cohort. If there were more than 24 students, in any classroom who wish to return to in-person learning, teacher continuity might not be viable for extra students. Also, there was no mention of cohort C, those students whose parents wish to have them remain on a distance learning plan. Um, I will stop with this last. I'm gonna continue on. Uh, I'll, I'll read this one in its entirety. Hold on one second. It is my hope that tonight's presentations will be better received by both the community and the teachers so that we can move forward into figuring out some of the other details such as supervision, supervision of students during the day, ventilation, making sure that classrooms have been inspected and system, systems are upgraded and working well, technology, checking all district classrooms to make sure issues have been resolved, safety concerns, PPE, plexiglass barriers, teacher preparation time, giving teachers time during the day to prepare quality lessons without increasing teacher workload, cleaning schedules for classrooms, and other concerns such as special services for SPED. Thank you for your time, the MTA Executive Board and Negotiations Team. Thank you, President <coughs> and Battle and Executive Board. <clears throat> One second. 
Take your time, Ms. Huff. I know it's a lot to read. Okay. Um, uh, the next public comment comes from Kristen Stepp. Uh, Kristen writes, good evening, Monrovia School Board. I am writing tonight not only as a concerned parent, but also as a previous student of Monrovia Unified School District. My oldest daughter is in second grade and my youngest is in TK at, at Brad Oaks. I have been very happy with the board until recently and, and some of the most recent decisions of certain board members. I have never written an email to the board before this pandemic, but I find during these times, it is important to speak up. I know as a working parent, any hybrid model put into action creates more stress and planning for me to find childcare, but the success of my child is more important. I wanted to share a conversation with the board that my eight-year-old had with me last night. Mommy, if we go back to school, will Miss Johnson be my teacher? She has made me feel so, so comfortable during these times, even through a computer. She is so funny and kind. I want to be able to still see her every day, even if it's through Zoom. Um, Ms. Stepp does continue on, but I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Ms. Stepp. And, okay, um, the next public comment comes from <clears throat> Natalie Ridley. Natalie writes, Dear board members, first, I would like to commend both the elementary and secondary task forces for their de dedication and hard work developing a hybrid model that both satisfies the criteria set forth to reopen schools, as well as meeting the needs of the students and families. This was no easy task. I believe that the model that was announced during the webinar on February 25th is the best possible model. It has a number of benefits. This model allows students from all cohorts to see their teacher and receive meaningful instruction on a daily basis. This model also satisfies the students who choose to enter the hybrid model, giving them a manageable amount of time for in-person instruction. This model is already being successful, successfully implemented in Glendora Unified School District. And Natalie does continue on, but I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Ms. Ridley. And the next public comment comes from Victoria. Victoria, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't pronounce your last name. Uh, Victoria writes, hello, I'm writing to you as an employee. Recently, Dr. Therosian stated that the district will make available KN95 masks for staff instead of N95. N95 is the best protector in day-to-day -day situations because it's medical grade. As a classroom aide, we are with students daily and, cl and closer than most. Certain administrative staff that do not deal with, with students or the public on a day-to-day -day basis are being provided N95 masks. We will, get substandard, we will get substandard protection, which are deemed mostly fake and not even medical grade. Why are the staff being provided substandard masks when the district administration gets in 95? Not providing a medical grade mask to staff that deal with the students firsthand will jeopardize the health and safety of students, staff, and parents daily when we go into the hybrid model. Thank you, Victoria each. Thank you for your comments. And I think we are nearing the end. Um, this comment came after our last board meeting, um, but it was already, we were already well into our meeting. So um, this comment comes from Amy Graham. And uh, Amy writes, how is it in the best interest of the child to go to school two days a week for two hours? If a parent is unable to take their child to school from 12.30 to 2.30, then that child misses out. Please help the parents understand how this is the best option. I understand that there is no perfect option. And, uh, thank you very much, Ms. Graham. Uh, the next public comment comes from 
Eileen Rodstad. Eileen writes, I am supportive of my child returning to school. I would like to see more hours of in-person teaching provided than what is currently proposed. I personally am not concerned about viral risk for my child. We have had medical workers caring for thousands of patients severely infected with COVID for over nine months before a vaccine was available. I don't believe elementary school reopening will be a place of high risk for COVID transmission, even without teachers being vaccinated. That is my personal opinion, and I realize many will not be in agreement with this. Thank you, Eileen Rockstad. Thank you, Ms. Rodstad, for your comments. And I believe this is the last comment. Uh, again, this comment came out following our last board meeting, um, too late for the admission. Um, it comes from Melissa Levers. Uh, Melissa writes, Dear Board of Education, I was not able to submit my comment earlier. I have a couple of concerns regarding the return of school. They are as follows. One, how will the state's guidelines be equally met for all elementary schools prior to welcoming students back? Two, what means of transparency will the district take to ensure protocol, protocols are equitable district-wide and safety, and safety protocols? Three, COVID-19 pandemic is in no way resolved and likely won't be for some time. If conditions worsen, what contingencies does a district have to return to 100% distance learning? And Melissa does continue on with further questions, but I am going to stop there. Thank you, Ms. Levers. And so that was the last one, Ms. Huff. That was the last one. All right, thank you for reading all of those. And again, thank you to the public for sending us these public comments. Um, uh, as Ms. Huff said earlier, she will be submitting those co public comments to the entire board in their entirety. Um, and uh, they will be responded to. And I also suspect that many of these questions and concerns will be addressed in uh, Dr. Tarosian's information report this evening. So please stay tuned to that. Uh, Ms. Huff, are there any public comments for items not on, I'm sorry, for the for items on the agenda? There are none. Thank you very much, Ms. Huff. Take a sip of your tea, a long sip. And with that, we will go to the informational reports and presentations, uh, teaching and learning pandemic update. And Dr. Trozian, I believe we're starting with you. Yes, thank you, President Trevanti, members of the board. I, again, our practice is not to discuss any of the public comments, but I do need to uh, correct them when they are uh, absolutely incorrect. We are not distributing N95 masks to anybody. Uh, I think I, uh, I, and of course I'll, I'll reach out or somebody from the staff will reach out to, to explain the, the difference. And I just don't want anybody thinking that we are actually going through that um, that fit test, the spray test, putting in those um, uh, plans, uh, we, we do not have that capacity. With that, uh, I do want to provide an overview. We, I have asked some folks to join me in the presentation today. You're gonna hear much less from me, you know, mostly a good thing and much more from experts, those who have been working through um, the different models. And uh, as President Trevanti noted earlier, we will be um, hearing what the elementary task force has been uh, working on since uh, since our last meeting, once we provided, uh, once the board provided uh, some additional guidance. I do want to uh, commend the task force members. I know that not only did they meet after the meeting, but uh, on campuses with principals through um, the evening on Thursday, uh, elementary principals worked uh, together, taking in some of the input through Friday and continued throughout this week, trying to develop a model that, that really best served the needs of our um, community working and, and living up to the name, they worked on a task and they worked on that collaboratively uh, it is a passionate group and a committed group to this district and to the children of this community. And, and for that, I, 
I wholeheartedly thank them. Uh, our hybrid learning pods, I uh, will be providing some additional information there. Um, and in this presentation uh, with the hybrid learning pods, we talk about the different uh, guidance. One of the other inaccuracies noted in um, one of the public comments read earlier was that uh, classrooms could not have more than 14 students. Instruction can have more than 14 students, assuming they are six feet apart. Uh, it is the learning pods, childcare, that requires uh, that absolute maximum. And we'll be able to read through the, the guidance that is really just lifted from the uh, Los Angeles County Department of Public Health reopening of schools checklist. Uh, Canyon Early Learning Center will be provided with an uh, update from uh, Mr. McFadden about uh, the reopening there and, and their reopening plans. Some uh, information about the, the transmissions, vaccinations, ventilation. Uh, this is uh, a report that um, is part of which has been provided biweekly. And then uh, Dr. Jackson will uh, present from the secondary task force and provide an update from that team that uh, they have been really working, I think, weekly for the last month. And again, I, I can't say it enough. Both task forces have uh, so many other commitments and they are committing their time and their uh, energy and their heart to developing something for our district. And, and uh, their work is so valuable and serves as a launching uh, place for us to really develop a model um, that meets everybody's needs. So thank uh, the secondary task force as well. And I look forward to their update. And we have Assembly Bill 86 was passed on Friday, March 5th. And I'd like to just provide some bullet points. Uh, there's much more that we need to study and discuss. It's, uh, I've not gotten through the entire report. And as I do, I'll share the information. With that, I'd like to uh, go to the next slide and invite uh, board member Anderson to just share with us her as the board liaison to the elementary task force. While she was late in being assigned to that task force, she is uh, nonetheless earnest in her interest in making sure we have nothing but the best for our students. So with that, I'll pass it along to board member Anderson. Thank you, Dr. Tarosian. Uh, it was a great privilege to serve alongside the members of our task force, and I was very appreciative of that opportunity. Um, I would like to thank them all for, for well, I'm, I'm going to speak directly to them. I would like to thank you all for your continued hard work and dedication to this process. I know we've put a great deal of time and effort and the thought into securing the best plan possible for our students. It was very evident that the task force was both immensely thoughtful and put forth thorough consideration. This truly was a unique process and a very challenging one, and it had multiple steps. With all of your insight and collaboration, this task force was able to produce a plan that was a great starting place and the first step in this process. The next step required us to not only share the foundational model, but to gather input from our larger stakeholder groups, parents, families, and our community at large. This recommended model was met from our larger community with great concern and a clear indication that it did not yet quite meet the needs of our families. The Board of Education's responsibility is to ensure the best interest of all students. Weighty decisions such as these entail listening, not only to the recommendations put forth by our task forces, but also by those that are directly affected by the plans we put into place. As these were not in alignment, the Board of Education had the following directions. Our schools need to be open full days for students who choose in-person instruction. And the model needs to be equitable for all students and all cohorts. Once again, 
On behalf of the Board of Education, thank you. Thank you for all of your efforts. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for the care you so obviously took in developing this hybrid plan. Your work provided a critical piece to the puzzle. We understand that this was an extremely challenging task, but with the great talent and dedication we have in Monrovia, we've been able to use this framework designed by our elementary task force to help create an inclusive plan that offers more for everyone. Thank you. And now I'm gonna pass this on to uh, Dr. Sue Kaiser. Thank you, Jennifer. Good evening. It's my pleasure to give an update to the board and to the public on the elementary task force and the schedule and the work that has gone on so far. Next slide, please. I'd like to first of all also thank our task force, which was comprised of over 20 folks that were teachers and parents and administrators, classified employees, and most of all, everybody focused on the very best thing for the students. Some of the guiding interests are listed here. And these were listed by the folks on the task force representing their representative groups. And the first one was safety for all of our students and staff. Every decision that we made, everything that we looked at, had the student, the children in mind, making sure that their interests would be represented in our task force meetings. Along those lines, very importantly, um, looking at models that would maintain the current teacher-student relationship so that children would not be moved to a new teacher at the end of the year. Making sure that we have equity in instruction, especially when considering the needs of our most vulnerable learners. We know that some students have lost some learning during this last year, and we wanna make sure that we have the very best situation for every one of our students and taking care of those students that are most at risk. We also know that teachers need adequate time for planning. We're asking them to switch their practice up to a new practice that they may be very unfamiliar with. And in order to do a great job with that, they need time to plan and to walk through and rehearse the movements of a day. Additional in-person time with, within the classroom with the teacher was an interest that we were addressing based on the feedback from the community given through the Board of Education at our last meeting. We know that there are families that need to have their students supervised from 8 a.m. till 2.30, the course of a regular school day. And then looking at our secondary schedule, how do we align the students um, being out in the school buildings at the same time, if, if you have a child who's in elementary, middle and high school, spanning those spans so that families have some semblance of routine. And then making sure that we've dedicated some time that's adequate for those students who are remaining 100% in distance learning, that they are not shorted with time with their teacher. So this was a tall order to look at these interests and underlying these interests, these were the interests that grew out of the, the folks on the committee. We also were guided by several Senate bills and assembly bills that were passed that required things such as making sure that we ensure the teaching of all state standards. Another one was making sure that we have face-to-face -face time with teacher and student, with all students every day, whether it's in distance learning or face-to-face -face in the classroom, and that we achieve peer-to-peer -peer interaction daily, whether it's in, in inside the classroom in three-dimensional or whether it is through the distance learning platform. These are the requirements that we looked at that we were un, unwilling to, to bend on these as we developed our schedule. Next slide, please. So here is how the schedule um, panned out. As um, people began to look at it with looking at it from you know, eight to two and then having another 30 minutes for um, students to be on campus if they need the daycare time. And so I'll walk through what it looks like. And you'll see that the pink column is the activity that the students will be doing. 
the column that is um, in green says instructional minutes for the in-person rumors, the students that are face-to-face -face with their teachers. What were the, will those minutes be? The students that are at home, we use the platform of Zoom, so we, we're referring to them as Zoomers. Those at-home students, um, what will their minutes look like in instruction with their teacher? Um, and so from 8 to 8.30, students will arrive. And um, it's not the old-fashioned kind of arrival where we have everybody barging through the door at the same time. We've got to come in in an orderly, slower way where, um, where our students are being greeted at the gate and let in slowly because we can't have them more than less than six feet apart and we can't have them gathering. And then from 8.30 to 9, the teacher will conduct a morning meeting and an opening. Very typically in an elementary school, this is time for the teacher to set the day, to talk about the things that are going to be happening, um, discuss what work was done the previous day to create a bridge for the brain so that they have a, a transition from what where they ended the previous day coming into the new day. Um, they take care of the calendar duties, the flag salute, and the duties of the day, those morning routines. And they also do some of their social emotional learning at this time, which is also a requirement in our Senate bills and our assembly bills that was added when we went into distance learning. Um, and this morning meeting and opening time will be done with the students at home and the students in the classroom at the same time where the teacher will have students quietly in front of them and also talking to the computer to get this accomplished in a morning meeting to set the day. And then from nine o'clock to 1130, there's a model that we looked at and the elementary principals um, got together and said, this would really work. It's called a high flex model. It's a form of a hybrid model. And what it means by high flex in the, the word is that it's very flexible. And our elementary teachers are very used to teaching their children in small groups in having one group doing some independent work while they're work, working with another group live. And they've been able to accomplish that while the students have been in distance learning also. So during this time from nine o'clock to 1130, the teacher will be rotating their students um, asynchronous, asynchronously and synchronously in person and the students at home um, during this time. And that will be 150 minutes for each group. There will be um, short breaks, not a full blown recess where children are gathering on the playground, but small breaks as needed during this time. And we'll have rotating um, aid, that, we'll have an, an, an aid that can take care of the students while the teacher takes a break and students will have rolling breaks. From 11.30, at 11.30, we'll begin a grab-and-go lunch time for students who would choose to go home. Families, some families may say we can um, take care of the rest of the day at home, um, while the teacher in the afternoon will be doing the high-flex model again, and it will be a, a distance learning model during this time. So um, from 11.30 to 12.30, the students that remain on campus will be in learning pods and they will be learning from their teacher in the distance learning fashion. Next slide, please. This is what it might look like in a high flex model. Um, this would be a kindergarten or a TK classroom where there's one student at a, class, at a table. Each student has their own materials. Um, and the tables, when the, the class moves over from the Monday, Tuesday to the Thursday, Friday model, the tables and things would be cleaned and the students belongings that are on the table belong to that student. Everybody has their own materials. There's no cross sharing of material. Um, this kind of a model where, you know, you, you just see a sense of peace and happiness here where we see children and teachers together in the same room. And we haven't seen that for a very long time. And so it gives the teachers and the students a chance to have that social emotional need met that we know is so lacking right now in so many of our students. Next slide, please. 
Here's another picture of what it might look like in a classroom. And these are these children are a little bit older, but you can see that they're they're spaced six feet apart. Um, they're very distanced. And yet the teacher and the student are in the same space, and you can you can sense that feeling of community even though they're not very close to one another. And so you're seeing here social distancing and the, the wearing of the mask and students in their own spaces. Next slide, please. So the high flex model, this high flex model allows the students to move on a fluid schedule between in-person, synchronous and asynchronous lessons. There's a center station rotation approach as seen in this di diagram where teachers will be able to set this up as needed. While one group is working in the asynchronous assignments, the other group will be working with their teacher on assignments, um, which is very similar to how a regular traditional elementary classroom runs anyway. Next slide, please. And so the Wednesday schedule is that day when we'll have the rooms deep cleaned where everything will be wiped down and it's the changing of the guards from the Monday, Tuesday cohort to the Thursday, Friday cohort. And all students will be learning from their remote stations, whether they're in pods or at home. And the teachers will be doing very, a very similar routine with the morning meeting in the morning and then the asynchronous and synchronous work in the high flex model. And we'll take a digital break, a home recess like they do right now in distance learning, and then come back for more teaching and learning in the high flex model. And then at 1130, the students will have their lunch time and then they'll have asynchronous instruction for the rest of the day. Um, and this will allow the teachers to have some of that much needed planning time. Next slide, please. So our timeline, as we look at the timeline from today um, into spring break, what might it look like? And you'll notice that there are asterisks um, behind most of the statements that are made here and the dates. And th that's because these are subject to date of board approval because we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but this is what a potential timeline might look like. There are many things that need to be done. So we, we would look toward the board to take a look at our model, give some input and have this approved within the next week or so. So between March 12th and 24th, and then potentially the week of March 15th, once the model's approved, we will be sending out commitment forms to the families. The principals will be presenting these schedules to the families in their own communities so that they can answer questions about the models and how it will work at their school. And the teachers will have their technology distributed to them and they'll begin to set up their rooms because it's a significant um, difference from what they've been doing for the past year. The week of March 22nd, students will be assigned to cohorts. Um, the new hybrid learning pods will be established. We will be creating some new pods and we'll have learning pod orientation and student assignments in those pods. March 22nd and 23rd, um, should the timeline march in this order, these two days would be set aside for classroom preparation for our teachers to go in and to complete the preparation in their classroom. In the morning, they would have one hour of distance learning and then the remainder of the day, would, would there would be asynchronous assignments for students to work on independently. March 25th to April 1st, we would be planning a staggered return to school by grade level so that we are orientating groups of students, smaller groups of students at a time to the new behavioral procedures that we're going to be requiring of them. Um, students that are in say third or fourth grade, they do have a memory of coming to school and running around on the playground and hugging their friends and playing tag. And those procedures and routines need to be trained. We need to go slowly. We need to take our time and make sure that all students have adequate training in what the new behavioral norms are going to be at school. 
And then April 2nd through 9th is our spring break. And we'll have, a, we'll have time to reflect on how this month has gone and be able to make some adjustments as necessary. So again, I wanna thank our um, elementary task force people and the input that we received from all of the groups. Um, it, ha it has been a very large order and yet I feel that the group was very thoughtful and very intentional in their deliberation. I'm so appreciative. Next slide, please. So our next steps, we will be looking at those arrival and dismissal procedures that I discussed, and they are unique to each school. We can't make one set of them and say, this is the way everybody's going to do it. Um, everybody has different in entrances and exits in their schools. And that needs to also be communicated to families so that families know that we're not dropping at the front of the school anymore, we're using the side. Another group is going to use the front. Um, we will be establishing our, our new pods. We will also be developing the supervision schedule and developing our staffing. Um, there's a big puzzle that needs to be figured out with staffing the, the supervision of each campus. We will be, be distributing the technology so that teachers can fluidly flex between the classroom and their at-home friends. And so they will be setting up their computers, their tablets, their document cameras, their speakers, and their microphones, making sure that the systems in every classroom are conducive to this type of work. Next slide, please. There were some additional questions that came that were of interest to our community. And one of them was uniforms. The question was, can they be optional for the rest of the year? We're coming back so late. And I'm a parent. I had, I had four children that went through elementary school and I thought, oh my gosh, they grow so much in the summertime. You don't wanna buy all new clothes now and then have to rebuy them in September. So appropriate school attire will be required as, as delineated in the uniform waiver policy. Um, we're not going to be requiring brand new uniforms this time of the year. Parent commitment is for the remainder of this school year when opting for the 100% distance learning. If a parent um, decides that they wanna be in the hybrid, they will have to wait until the beginning of next year for whatever model that is, because that too may be very different than what we have right now. If a student is in the hybrid learning and, they're, and it's not meeting the needs of the child, they can go into distance learning at any time. So these were the additional questions that had been asked by several parents that we wanted to address in this presentation tonight. Next slide, please. I'd like to hand this, this presentation now over to my colleague. Um, and that is the work of our elementary task force. And again, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Uh, I will be uh, reviewing the next couple of slides. Uh, so uh, I appreciate um, uh, the opportunity to do so, Board President Trevanti, Board Members, Dr. Tarosian and Cabinet. Um, I'll, be, I'll be talking about some of the protocols from LA County Public Health, where we're at with our hybrid, um, hybrid pod development, and uh, some information about CELC. Uh, before I do that, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, publicly acknowledge the hard work and the dedication that uh, the staffs from uh, the learning pods, which includes our village and non-village classified employees and our preschool folks uh, that have done a great job in, in these circumstances over, over the last year, really, um, in, in providing uh, services and meeting the needs on a variety of fronts for, for our families. So uh, kudos to them, and we, we'll march on here. As, um, as was brought up in uh, public comment, and as, as we've been meeting with a variety of uh, task force and hearing from parents on my end, uh, hearing from our community, hearing from employees, there's been some concerns about um, a couple of different things. And we always go by, um, we'll continue to go by the guidance that uh, drives us. In this case, LA Co County Public Health puts out a variety of guidances for uh, for the return to school. This one in particular um, is the K-12 return to school guidance. The guidance that drives the uh, 
the learning pods is the uh, is the daycare for school aged children guidance. And I, I'm not going to read um, the entire guidance, but some of it was brought up. So um, uh, it's useful to go over this. Um, as mentioned, uh, instruction must be assigned to stable groups that maintain stable membership uh, of students and instructors day to day do not mix with other stable groups. The size of these stable groups is not limited to specific maximum number, but is dependent upon the utilization of the available classroom space to allow physical distancing of six feet between students and staff. So there's not a number here in the classrooms. What it, what it alludes to is that the students need to be kept safely apart by six feet or more uh, in the classroom. So it's not, uh, and that's where it's different than the school age cohorts. School age cohorts just got increased to 14, so we can house 14 uh, students in the learning pods. Um, the other uh, piece of this guidance uh, talks about the other student devices or services described above, namely daycare for school age children, which is our learning pods, and our other child care programs are allowed to, to operate at the same time. So there are some, some questions coming up about whether uh, students can go from a classroom in-person instruction and into a learning pod or vice versa. And uh, this guidance spells that out for us that that is allowed um, by LA County Public Health. Um, next slide, please. So our hybrid learning pods update, we've been busy along with everybody else uh, uh, doing a variety of things. Uh, creating the uh, the next phase of our hybrid learning pods in, in anticipation of uh, the hybrid model um, is is something we're working on behind the scenes, and we're ready to launch when um, when the hybrid model is launched. Um, the structure that we're looking at was uh, discussed and being implemented with uh, the hybrid model in mind, um, and we want to give families the flexibility to have supervision. Uh, uh, part day, full day, and on some days of the week, knowing that we may end up with a model where they may be on campus a couple of days a week, they may be needing to be in a supervised setting or child care in, in the PM uh, afternoons, or they may need child care the whole, the whole week at varieties of times. So um, what we're looking at is developing activities within our, within our pods so that we have a Monday, Tuesday uh, schedule, we have a Wednesday schedule, and we have a Thursday, Friday schedule. And not, within those schedules or within those pods, um, we can have an all day, all day long supervision and also part day supervision so the students can go from classroom to pod on the days that they are attending, whatever those days end up, uh, end up being. Um, similar to the uh, model that was discussed, Wednesday would be a, uh, a full day in the pod day uh, since uh, students are not in the classroom, so we have that. And uh, this gives the, the families the flexibility to sign up for a Monday, Tuesday schedule, a Wednesday schedule, a Thursday, Friday schedule, or all of those and have uh, the ability to have care uh, all week, all week long. <clears throat> the staffing intent is to um, keep our current staff working uh, the hybrid pods. Uh, we're working with Dr. Jackson to identify and add additional staff so that we could bring on more pods um, as staffing allows and space allows on campus as well. When the time comes to register for the hybrid learning pods, um, we'll, we'll have that registration again online through our uh, Easy Child Track online system. Uh, existing families that are in the pods now, along with um, the families that are not in the learning pods, will be given the same opportunity to register uh, for these spaces in the hybrid pods. And the reason why the existing families are going to need to re-register are for two reasons. One is um, we need our students to end up back at their home schools. Uh, we have students in pods that are not currently attending their um, their home school, but based on space, they 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 were they may be at a Brad Oaks pod, but they attend Wild Rose, and we have kids all over the place. So we got to get them back to their home schools. And like I mentioned, we want to give all families an equal opportunity to register for the hybrid pods. Um, based on what you see here are these priorities for enrollment. Um, so we have four priorities for enrollment, uh, which, which would serve us to uh, meet the needs of our most at-risk students. So uh, first priority, fostering homeless youth. Um, children of essential workers is our second priority. Uh, essential workers also includes um, those in education, uh, teachers, aides, et cetera. So uh, we, can, we can help address uh, some of those concerns that were brought up today about childcare, 
of existing uh, uh, staff within Monrovia Unified, our disengaged students, um, and then st finally students who qualify for uh, free and reduced lunch. So we want to be able to give our, our Monrovia Unified students the ability to participate uh, depending on uh, our space and availability um, in the pods. Um, are there any questions about that so far? If not, we'll, we'll move on. Probably at the end, I, I would say we would have some questions. Okay, sure. Thank you. So, so next slide, please. Um, so the, the hybrid learning pods, the fee structure. Uh, currently, our fee structure is um, based on a $60 a week um, uh, contribution by our parents. That's what we ask for. Um, and then we have a sliding scale uh, that is um, uh, a sliding scale for um, different uh, groups. So homeless foster youth uh, get a free program, of course. Uh, those on reduced lunch get uh, the prices reduced to $50 per week. Uh, free lunch students, the prices are reduced forty dollars per week, and a sibling discount if they have more than one child in the program would be twenty dollars per week. So, with the proposed um, hybrid structure, we're, we're going to change this to a per day, um, a per day fee of twelve dollars, uh, which keeps it in line with the sixty dollars a week. If you do the math, five days a week, twelve dollars a day is still sixty dollars. Uh, and again, with the variety of discounts in our sliding scale, so that. Uh, foster homeless, homeless youth get a free program. Uh, reduced lunch discount would be $10 a day for those students. Free lunch discount would be $8 per day. And then siblings would also be $8 per day. Um, so that would be for our full day Monday, Tuesday, our full day Wednesday, and our full day Thursday, Friday students. Our part day fee, so the students that may come into our program, say at 1130 uh, to 230, when, when the, when the uh, instruction for the day ends, it would be $6 per day. And then um, again, foster homeless youth would be free program and then free reduced lunch and siblings would, would be $4 uh, for the part day, part day program in the, in the learning pods and the hybrid learning pods. Um, so that is, that is the fee uh, structure. Uh, the next slide is going to um, go over um, CELC. So before we transition to that, um, if there are some uh, questions I may entertain about the, about the hybrid pods. Any questions for Tom McFadden? Jennifer? Hi, Mr. McFadden. Thank you Hi. so much. Um, just going through this, I, I see the parallels. It, it, uh, weekly is five times um, the cost of uh, uh, the per day structure, except for the bottom line there, the sibling discount uh, on the current fee structure is $20 a week. Um, and one fifth of that is, is $4, not $8. What is the rationale for the $8? Um, the eight on the, on the proposed schedule? Uh, so yes. <laughs> Right. Um, we, we were doing it off the, uh, uh, off the proposed full day structure. So that would be $8 times the five days would be $40. Um, the sibling discount right now um, is $20. So that might be something that we have to look to adjust to, to bring it, you know, in parallel. And, and then that, um, I don't know if it would, if it would change no, it would. I don't think it would change anything else. I think that was that was the only one. So. Okay. okay, so we can take a look at that. And, and there may be a rationale for it. I was just wondering what it was. No problem. Um, if, it, if it was deliberate or or if there was another reason. Thank you. Sure. Elaine, I think you had your hand up. Thank you. Hi, Mr. McFadden. Hello. Thank you for your presentation. Um, so there are some parents that will be wanting to take advantage of this hybrid learning pod that have never um, set up a, uh, a payment portal before. Right. So how will we be helping parents with, with all of the processes that will be going on into returning um, to school? Will there be a detailed um, instruction and help for parents to be able to find this portal, um, connect with it, and be able to, to pay for this st uh, structure, this uh, this opportunity. Um, yeah, so uh, Dr. Uh, Kaiser had mentioned uh, in the timeline that there's going to be a parent meeting for uh, the hybrid model. So that will be one where we'll present 
you know, how, how to get onto the Easy Child Track portal, what to do with registration. Um, we're also going to be sending out information and, and steps through, uh, through Parent Square, um, and we'll send communication that way. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to <laughs> record myself uh, on a Zoom meeting, uh, going through a registration, uh, and then I could post that uh, for everyone to access so they could see me register one of my my kids who are no longer in Monrovia Unified, but I'll register them anyways. And we'll, Thank we'll you. Thank you. As a parent yeah. of children that um, do use the Easy Easy Child Portal, um, you know, I, I know that that it's it's a process, and you just need to um, be able to be helped through it. And I appreciate you being able to address that to help out our parents and in any and every way possible. I appreciate that. Um, my next question, I do not expect you to have an answer to tonight, but what I'm looking for is um, finding out how we're going to get this answer for parents. In one of your previous slides, well, when you laid out the guidance from the LA County Department of Public Health that said there does not, uh, there isn't guidance on the um, number of students in a class as long as they're six feet apart, at some point, we're going to be able to have an idea of how many kids will be in the in-person cohorts. Do you have an idea yet at what time you will have that? Um, is it something that you will have? Will it be by site for the principal? And what would that? when would that information be given to parents? And again, I, I, I know you don't have the answer for that now. So, no problem. Um, but, but that is just uh, something that I'm thinking about is, if there's not a, a cap on the maximum, and there is a cap, the cap is the size of the room. Correct. And just as a point of clarification, that is for instruction that does not impact the child care uh, rules under which the learning pods uh, abide. Yes, thank you so, for that clarification. So just making sure that um, we understand that no learning pod will be larger than 14. Yes, and because that was very clear. And thank you for pointing that out again. Yeah. But that is so, something that I'm, you know, if you can let us know when you will know that, that would be appreciated. Those are my only two questions for you um, thus far. So thank you very and, much. And just one more point of clarification. Um, the children of essential workers uh, are certainly include our teachers and our, uh, all educators within our district, all staff members within our district. Uh, however, the children need to be enrolled within our schools. Just making sure that we understand that this is for Monrovia Unified Student, School District students. Okay. I'm sorry, Mr. McFadden. That's okay. Are there any other questions for uh, Mr. McFadden? All right. Well, thank you very much for presenting the uh, about the hybrid learning plans and the fee structure. Very no, informative. No and no very problem. Positive. I'm not done yet. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, it's we're obviously going to, we're going to move on to CELC though, if we're if that's okay with y'all. No, I, I was just going to say it's a very complex plan. Is oh, when you bring in the fee structure and the amount of time and days and et cetera. So, um, thank you very much for working all of that out. Appreciate it. Oh, uh, sure. No, no problem. I, I have a, a great teammates. That is 100% for sure. Um, so on, on to the other program that I have the pleasure of working with and that I'm very fond of is our preschool program. Um, I just wanted to uh, give an update on how we've uh, uh, developed our own uh, version of, of a hybrid model uh, for Kenya Early Learning Center. Um, we um, we developed and we're keeping an eye on the uh, elementary model as this as this unfolds and was unfolding. Uh, so we have some parallels to the hybrid model from the elementary task force, which which I was able to be a part of and continue to be a part of. We also gathered information from parents, teachers, office staff. We collected data in a couple of different ways, including surveys, polls, and most importantly, we had our uh, teachers uh, interview each of their parents. Uh, to get an idea of what, what their preference was for uh, remaining on distance learning or going to the hybrid model. Um, and, and that received a 100% response rate. So uh, we had some good data uh, going forward with uh, how to plan and develop a, a proposed 
a hybrid model. Um, I, I also have to say that there's a different set of guidance from LA County Public Health uh, that, that guides uh, the preschool programs. So uh, we, <laughs> we will follow the guidance particular to the group that we're working with. So whether it's a pod, a preschool, a school reopening, uh, LA County Public Health will be, will be the driving force in terms of our guidance on that. Um, so we'll take a peek here, what we've come up with for a hybrid model on the next slide. Thank you. Um, so we uh, are, are looking at a hybrid model where our current AM classes would come to school on Mondays and Tuesdays. They'd be in person at CELC. Uh, Wednesdays would be our, our deep cleaning and our meeting day. We meet with our parents once a week currently in our distance learning program, which has been very successful, uh, by the way. And then Thursdays and Fridays, they would uh, continue their uh, distance learning as we're doing it now. So they would be with us two days a week, Mondays, Tuesdays, asynchronous learning on Wednesdays and then Thursdays, Friday uh, with their teacher via Zooms. We have our little preschoolers uh, Zooming as well. Um, and that, that's been quite fun to see. Um, and so that is our, that's our AM classes. And then our PM classes uh, would do something similar except just flipped. So Mondays and Tuesdays, they're doing distance learning. Wednesdays is the asynchronous learning uh, meeting day. Uh, cleaning day, and then Thursdays and Fridays, uh, they would be in person at CELC. All the classes um, we've identified, again, per the, per the guidance from LA County Public Health, we have proposed staggered start times for our AM and our PM sessions. We've identified uh, all the entrances and exits uh, where they have to come into and out of the school. We've laid out some little paw prints all over so that we have our one-way uh, uh, form of travel. Um, so we're excited about having our, our, our students on campus. Uh, at the same time, there are some families uh, through these polls and these interviews that want to remain on distance learning. Uh, and we have... Um, uh, some staff that have actually uh, reached out to HR to be able to stay on distance learning. So I'm working with Dr. Jackson on what that would look like in terms of accommodations and having them uh, take over the distance or continue the distance learning part as the other, uh, as the other staff does the in-person hybrid model as we go along. So that's our AM and our PM classes. And then um, we also have our, our, our SPED students, our special day class and our full day uh, classes are, our special day uh, classes will also have an AM and a PM session. And I'm really excited to be able to uh, work and, and partner with our SPED department and, uh, and Jennifer Johnson in, in coming up with a model for some of these uh, students in the SDC classes to be mainstreamed into our in-person uh, uh, offerings of hybrid with some support from our uh, SDC teachers and aides. Um, so uh, that is going to be an exciting launch when we go hybrid uh, to have have these kids mainstreamed into the uh, gen ed classes, whether it's AM or PM sessions. And then our full day class per CDE, another set of guidance we get to follow, um, needs to come back full day. So we will be doing that as well. So our the students in our full day classes will be coming at, back full day and we'll be serving those students in a range of their service hours uh, between 7.30 a.m. and 5 p.m. Uh, you know, every day that we have a school in session. Um, so that's that's a brief interview, uh, overview of our hybrid model. Um, again, I can entertain questions uh, if there are, are questions about, about uh, what we're doing here with CELC. Any questions? I'm not seeing any. So I think we're good here. Tom, thank you very much for presenting. You, Glenn. you no, uh, my pleasure to do so. And I think um, Dr. Tarosian is going to be next with some uh, the next part of our presentation. Thank you so much. I just want to say, Tom, thanks so much. It's good to see you. It's been thank a long you. Time. It's actually good to see everyone. We can't wait to see these kids on campus. I can tell you that. I bet. And I do want to note that. Um, we didn't get to a point to ask questions on the, the new flex model for elementary schools. We will get there. We just have a lot to present, um, but we will have an opportunity for board members to ask questions on the on that plan. So go ahead, Dr. Terosian. Thank you, President Trevanti, members of the board. I'd like to echo Mr. McFadden's uh, gratitude towards our Learning Pod staff. Now, as you know, there's 
a great deal of concern about is it safe, uh, some trepidation about keeping students uh, in classes, what about the ventilation? We have had our learning pods going since, I believe, October with 61 staff members and uh, serving approximately 130 students. And the, they are intrepid educators helping children every day. And it is just uh, wonderful to be able to see actually children on campuses. Uh, Again, our, my biweekly report here of the number of in-person assessments has, of course, increased since the last we met. Uh, and we also have one more exciting uh, development, and that is that football is allowed to compete, given some guidelines, and of course, we will always follow them. And there is a scrimmage this Friday. I'd like to wish the team well. Go Wildcats. I'm only sorry that I can't be there because I am not related in living in the home of any of the players. Those are the only individuals allowed to attend. Otherwise, it would have been such a treat to be able to be on the sidelines again. Next slide, please. Our uh, transmission rate uh, continues to remain flat. Uh, we've had uh, zero staff to staff um, transmission since December. Um, zero student to student ever, zero student to staff, zero staff to student, again, with the approximately 350 students who are regularly on our campuses. Next slide, please. Ventilation. Now, I am providing the information from the LA County Department of Public Health regarding measures to put in place to promote optimal ventilation in schools. And this is a checklist. And we're asked to check when we submit our safety plans. And uh, I do not want to in any way appear like I know much about ventilation, which is why we have experts in our field. And we have also contracted with a third party to ensure that Everything has been upgraded, updated, cleaned, and at the highest efficiency levels possible. Uh, we are systematically going through every uh, classroom, every office, every area. And if the windows don't open, we're going to find an alternative. Uh, I don't pretend to know what those alternatives are, but I know that we will do what it takes. If the doors can't be opened because we have children eloping, we will put some systems in place and uh, likely uh, air purifiers in place to make sure that the ventilation continues to be clean. Uh, I do want to take just a minute to say that nowhere on those slides are the MERV 13s listed. Uh, the, the, the MERV 13s, or uh, as they're called, the minimal efficiency reporting value, uh, these filters go from one to 20. And uh, we have had in our district MERV 8s up until this point. They are efficient at trapping air particles, especially for you know, students with asthma or um, you know, breathing conditions, allergies, we are upgrading all of those to the MERV 13. It is higher efficiency and we are happy to do it. Um, we've, when I mentioned we have MERV 13s, but it also goes to MERV 20, MERV 17 through 20 is hospital grade. And you might be wondering why we, we choose not to so, uh, purchase the hospital grade filters. They are simply not compatible with our current system. If we went any higher than a MERV 13, we'd have to replace our entire heating, uh, ventilation, air conditioning systems. Our HVAC systems would have to be entirely replaced. And if you recall, we used some grant money a couple of years ago and we did uh, replace our HVAC systems at Plymouth and at 
Santa Fe. No. You know what? Ms. Wu will likely correct me shortly. But that cost us, a, you know, it would be a million dollars per school. The time it takes to change out the entire HVAC system and place the hospital grade MERV or anything above the MERV 13 would simply not be feasible. So I just, I am, I continued to be asked, why not anything higher than the MERV 13? Please know that that is the highest efficiency feasible within our district. Next slide, please. Vaccinations. And with this, I'd like to uh, turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Jackson, whose department has done an incredible job in making sure that everybody in, within the Monrovia Unified School District, all 850 some odd employees have access to vaccines. Dr. Jackson. Thank you, Dr. Tarosian. Good evening, Board President Trevanti, uh, members of the board, cabinet in the community. Uh, this evening, I'll provide the board with an update on vaccinations, as Dr. Tarosian just mentioned, uh, those opportunities that were presented for MUSD employees, the school reopening process for secondary schools, and then the work, the secondary task force has completed this far. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't just acknowledge we have a few uh, parent representatives that have joined us uh, this evening. Uh, Sarah Edgington, uh, she's by phone, and then Melissa Webster and Michelle Sheckman, um, each who have students uh, at the secondary level. Um, this surely was a team effort and could not have addressed this challenge without their support as, as well as others on the task force. Uh, so I appreciate them being here this evening as we continue on this journey uh, through this pandemic. So vaccinations are here before you. Uh, we distributed two surveys seeking interest in vaccinations to our approximate 850 employees, uh, inclusive of subs, coaches, as well as volunteers. Uh, approximately 460 responded um, to the survey. And then of that, uh, 310 actually indicated a need uh, for um, their doses through our partnership. Uh, 185 of those doses were provided through the City of Hope, uh, while 100 were distributed through alternative clinics such as Cal Poly Pomona, Cal State LA, uh, Monrovia Health, um, as well as Mercy Hospital. Uh, we were allocated 20 doses uh, yesterday in addition to the 140 already uh, allocated doses for our district for this particular uh, week. So as of today, 100% of those that have responded will have had an opportunity to receive their first dose uh, by this weekend. That's when the next clinic will be held at uh, the City of Hope. Next slide. Uh, prior to presenting the secondary task force update, let's just review briefly the current reopening status for secondary schools. Next slide. So the guidance for reopening schools indicates secondary grade levels may return to in-person instruction once LA County moves into the red tier. Excuse me. The requirement is for the county to remain between four to seven cases per 100,000 for two consecutive weeks. Uh, yesterday, LA County declined to 5.2 cases per 100,000. Uh, last Tuesday, we were at uh, 7.2. So this is good news for all as the cases continue on a downward trend. Next slide. We had a sizable secondary task force. I mentioned uh, or introduced three of our parents uh, moments ago. Uh, in addition to the three parents, we had an additional 25 members who have endeavored for many months uh, to work on crafting a hybrid model that brings our students back safely with the focus on equitable opportunities. Uh, in creating the models, the secondary task force considered state and Department of Public Health guidance, as well as interests communicated by parents, staff members, as well as student representatives. 
Uh, specifically, the schedule needed to meet the minimum of 240 minutes and provide daily live instruction. In addition, accountability must be met in the areas of grades and attendance. And again, most importantly, we followed the safety guidelines by creating schedules that incorporated cohorts and considered minimizing the number of students on campus, as well as reducing health risk and cleaning efforts. Next slide. The following list of interests also guided the task force. Again, safety of all stakeholders was essential. The schedules uh, being similar at the beginning and ending times to elementary level. Uh, students are provided in-person time with the teacher and uh, will retain the teacher they've had over the course of the year. In addition, siblings uh, being assigned to the same cohort. And again, looking through that equity lens, we wanted to develop a vi viable learning opportunities for both what we're calling uh, roomers and zoomers. Uh, Dr. Kaiser uh, mentioned that in her presentation as well, but uh, if you're just now joining us, rumors are those attending classes on campus um, on any particular day, while the Zoomers are those uh, receiving instruction uh, remotely. So how did we accomplish this particular task? Uh, next slide. So we collaborated with our Director of Technology, technology uh, Charles Provakin, uh, to work through this issue. Uh, the picture here depicts the teacher providing a lesson uh, via Zoom from the front of the room. The roomers, uh, those attending class on campus are at their desks watching the lesson as it's projected on the screen in an effort to limit the draw on the Zoom feed uh, and bandwidth. The Zoomer, Zoomers, those attending class remotely also receive the lesson via Zoom. Hence, Hence, the teacher is required to only plan one common lesson, uh, which was a significant uh, challenge to overcome. Uh, this structure will allow lessons to be ongoing and accessible daily, again, providing equitable opportunities for all students involved. And I think you'll, you'll hear throughout this presentation uh, that, lent, that equity lens. Uh, next slide. Uh, this second photo, again, is a picture of a different classroom, also depicting the rumors and the Zoomers uh, receiving equitable access to the lessons. Uh, only those working remotely or on Zoom as rumors can see the lesson uh, on the screen. Next slide. The task force having reviewed many schedules uh, here in Southern California, Northern California, down in the San Diego, uh, region uh, considered the needs of the community developing uh, these two models. Uh, a block schedule inclusive of three periods uh, for, for 90 minutes with a break and a lunch, and then a schedule with six 55-minute periods with a five-minute uh, passing period and a 35-minute lunch. Uh, students attending the hybrid model will be assigned to cohorts a or B, those are reflective of the students who wish to return to campus in that hybrid model uh, two times per week. And then those students attending 100% remotely will be assigned to uh, cohort C. Next slide. So here before you on the block schedule, students are attending three classes per day for 90 minutes, um, either on a Monday and Tuesday for cohort A, those are representative of the rumors. Um, and then cohort B and C on Monday and Tuesday would be considered the Zoomers and they're learning remotely. On Thursday and Friday, cohort B are on campus, considered the rumors with A and C uh, learning remotely uh, being considered the Zoomers. Zero period occurs two times per week for those students who have a zero period class. Uh, student school starts at 9 a.m. Uh, in this particular schedule to avoid scheduling conflicts with students enrolled in the early college program um, at the high school. Now we have incorporated uh, a 15 minute break. Uh, we really wrestled um, with figuring out how we can provide uh, some of that, some break time to address some, some of the Zoom fatigue that was brought forward as a concern. Uh, so a 15 minute break in the morning to address that we thought was viable. 
Um, I mentioned lunch is already incorporated into the schedule, which provides yet another break. Uh, and then there is time for our English language development and special education students um, in the uh, afternoon as it currently holds in the distance learning model. Wednesday is an asynchronous day for cohort A, B, and C to allow for that deep cleaning, uh, similar to the elementary uh, plan. Uh, however, the morning time on Wednesday, uh, which is a little bit different than the distance learning plan, will provide time for social emotional learning. That's been a consistent, uh, but to improve upon that distance learning model, we carved out additional time for intervention and extension uh, that Wednesday mo morning, uh, again, with the focus on equity uh, and providing additional opportunities for our students. Next slide. So, we did uh, take an opportunity uh, to identify uh, some advantages to this particular schedule, excuse me, which are on the left, and then uh, some, some of the challenges uh, on the right. So um, advantages, currently the distance learning model for secondary is in a three period block schedule at 60 minutes. Again, we would be uh, transitioning to a 90 minute, so it's more aligned to the current distance model. Uh, it allows for more time for in-depth lessons. So um, where we've heard uh, from teachers and parents and students that, uh, you know, the intervention times are uh, outside of the, the current model, uh, we would have time embedded uh, within that, that 90 minutes. So teachers having multiple transitions for for a small group, for, en for enrichment, for students to, to move ahead. And then for those uh, students still in need of mastering the concept um, that embedded intervention time. Uh, again, de dedicated time daily for English language learners and our special needs students. And uh, again, we have some additional uh, office hours and uh, intervention time uh, in the afternoon uh, for students who still uh, may need that additional support. Uh, challenges, I've mentioned, uh, you know, Zoom fatigue, I think it's inherent in, in, in both models. And um, if you talk to educators, um, you know, in California, uh, it, it's just inherent uh, in the current situation uh, that we're faced with. Um, longer classes, yes, um, there are, with it being 90 minutes, and then fewer teacher contact opportunities as there are uh, three classes uh, per day. Next slide. In the six period uh, model before you, cohort A, again, the rumor attends classes on, uh, on campus Monday and Tuesday. Uh, cohorts uh, B and C are Zoomers at this time. Then on Thursday and Friday, cohort B attends classes as the rumors. Cohorts A and Z are not on campus uh, as they are in Zoomer mode. Uh, passing periods of five minutes, lunch is 35 minutes, zero period in this case held four times per week, 55 minutes. Uh, school starts at 8.30 as there is no scheduling conflict with students enrolled in the early college program uh, at the high school in this particular model. As with the block schedule, uh, Wednesday is an asynchronous day for cohorts A, B, and C, allowing for that deep cleaning and again, we are approved upon the distance learning model by carving out additional time for intervention and extension. Uh, we do maintain uh, the social emotional learning component from nine to 10 o'clock, focusing on uh, our mental health uh, support for our students. Next slide. So again, uh, we discussed advantages to this particular uh, model. Definitely more frequent interaction uh, with teachers being that there's six periods. Um, there was a thought from our, our middle school staff, whether it was administrators uh, and or classified or certificated members that were on uh, the committee that they thought less seat time was better aligned to the attention span of um, the middle schoolers. Uh, the challenges here, um, six classes increases the number of cohorts and rotations on campus. Uh, that we really wrestled with this the five minute uh, passing period. If you've been on campus, the campuses, uh, whether it's Monrovia High School, Clifton, um, and or Santa Fe, probably a little bit more reasonable uh, at Canyon Oaks Mountain Park. Um, but 
the five minute passing period, we saw just as a challenge, we tried to uh, increase the passing period minutes, uh, but then we were uh, stealing time uh, for from instruction, which ultimately led to a feeling that uh, instruction would just be uh, hurried. Um, and then as a part of that, just limited time for in-class um, intervention, uh, uh, coupled with no opportunities uh, for, for office hours at, at the end of the day, because the six period day is basically running almost to uh, three, three o'clock or so. Next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, Rob has a question. Okay, hey, Darwin, can we just go back up to that? So I'll, I wanna just go back to that five minute passing. Yes. Um, uh, Wish use MHS. How many students is that on campus? About. Hmm. Well, if if we're just operating off of you know two thirds uh, being on campus, and then we'll go, um, you know, half of that. So say three twenty five, three three fifty for cohort A. Uh, maybe a little bit more than that. And then same for cohort B with the remainder staying uh, in the distance learning. A significant number of people. Yes. And they're going to be trying to navigate one-way stairwells, one-way hallways to get from one place to the other in five minutes, sometimes even having to go across campus. Yes. Okay. I, I see the problem now. Yes, and and those, um, if you if as a board member, if you have an opportunity to visit campuses, all, all of our campuses are ninety five percent or close to identifying the egress and ingress uh, ways uh, to and from campus, and there are a significant amount of uh, one way uh, corridors on these particular campuses. So again, that's why this five minutes uh, is is a challenge here. Let me ask one more question, just. Uh to get some history. What was the passing period prior to school closing? Uh, somewhere between seven and, and eight minutes with approximately the same amount of minutes. And that was without keeping any kind of social distancing? Correct. Okay, thank you. Most welcome. Please. Please go ahead. Just to follow up on what Mr. Hammond was ask, asking, five minutes to pass in between classes. Is there a bathroom break built into the schedule or does that need to go into the five minute passing period? That would go into the five minute passing period. Thank you. Jennifer. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Jackson. There was also some discussion that that might have to be staggered as well throughout the class period so that we didn't have congestion in the re restrooms. I don't you know, know if so that there, was fully resolved. There were a lot, of, um, thank you, uh, Board Member Anderson. There were just a significant amount of logistical issues uh, with this particular um, structure. I mean, if you, uh, if you reference back to the block schedule, um, you have, when you come out of first period, you're going into a 15 minute break. You come back into that, that second period, if you will, and then you transition right back out, uh, to lunch. And then you're back into your final period, uh, for the day. So some significant advantages on that three period versus a six period. Ms. Golar. Yes, because Aside from the movement of the students between class to class, if they're transitioning to different classrooms, the six period day deletes the opportunity for cleaning the classroom when you have different groupings of students entering those classrooms. So there's more frequent movement of larger groups of students with less time to accommodate that degree of movement, whether it's in the bathrooms, whether it's in the classrooms, um, a six period day multiplies the effect of that many students moving across the campus and eliminates the opportunity for cleaning 
to happen in between that movement. Whereas in the three period block schedule structure, those breaks you described, a morning break and a lunch break that allows more time, fewer passing periods, more time embedded to get those classrooms cleaned and, and then sweep through the bathrooms yet again. So I didn't see that listed as whether it's an advantage or a disadvantage. I, did, I didn't see cleaning um, as a point of action. And thank you for highlighting that, Board Member Golar. We, we did have um, multiple custodians on our task force as well. Um, and they definitely believed um, there were there was a, a cleaning advantage in that three period uh, day uh, versus the six period. They just thought um, it was it would be overwhelming. And if you um, you know just based on our staffing at at the middle schools, there's there's three custodians at at the middle schools, and then you you've got I think five or six. So we we would have to make some some adjustments uh, for a three period day to make it doable, but but six would be significantly overwhelming. Dr. Jackson, I'd like to thank the task force for coming up with these two different models and the comparison here. I think it, it for me, um, it makes it obvious that that first model of the 90 minute or three classes per day option is seems to be more viable and, and safer for all concerned. Um, I'm really liking the, the first model that you demonstrated on there. And, but again, thank you to, to the task force for coming up for these with these two different potential models. And I think it, it addresses everything that's needed. I think the 90 minute block also allows the teacher for some uh, creative instruction um, and they can get through more material in a 90 minute block. It's, it's, it seems like a win situation for me. I don't know if any other board members have thoughts on that. Uh, Mr. Hammond. Um, thank you for what you just said. It, sometimes you, when you're vetting issues, you have to look at items, even though you know that they're not the best item, just to make sure that it's on the table. Um, clearly, just from you know the presentation here in five minutes, most of us, and in fact, all of us have had grave concerns with the 55-minute uh, um, presentation. I just have one more question. It's particularly for the high school. Um, are lockers still in play, Darvin? Lockers are not going to be in play. Okay. Because now my next concern was, is how do you go back to a locker six times a day to get your material to get to the next one? And I mean, it, it would just be a cluster uh, that would be unmanageable. Right. Thank you. Jennifer? Um, two things to, to speak to you, your comment about lockers too, Mr. Hammond. Um, with a three period day, it's a lot easier to haul three class mm -hmm. books than six, right? I know that's easier on all of our, our, our students. Um, also, just a, a reminder um, that because of the two different cohorts and with the, with the, three period block schedule, um, we'll be only having two class periods before lunch. And so if we configure them appropriately, and, and I believe this is the plan, again, Dr. Jackson, correct me if I'm mistaken, please. Um, but period one will sit in specific locations and those will be toggled with period two. So the desks in period one will not be the same ones that are being used in the same classroom in period two. And then in the lunch period, there will be an even greater period of time for them to come in and do cleaning. So there's also more flexibility in terms of the number of times a desk is utilized per day, um, which hmm. assists the custodians. And hopefully I clarified that um, a little bit, but I, I know that was a big part of the conversation to, to aid them in getting through the. Um, you did, uh, Board Member Anderson, and I appreciate you bringing that forward as well. Um, 
just based on that statement, we have a, a meeting coming up with our director of MOT, who's working closely with um, our custodians to work on the logistics. Should this plan be the one uh, that that moves moves forward? I have a few more slides for you, Board okay. President Avanti. Okay, I was just going to ask a quick question, okay. um, Darvin. I noticed uh, Michelle Shetman is here, Melissa Webster, and Sarah Edgington. Yes. Are, are they going to be speaking, or are they just here? I just want to make sure I recognize yes, the task they, force members. They are, they are here. If there were some specific questions from a parent perspective, um, they wanted to be here for support. So Got it. Got it. Well, thanks for being here, ladies. All right, go ahead. Okay, next slide. Ms. Trevanti, I have um, another question. Uh, would you prefer me ask it at the end of Dr. Jackson or can I end, uh, ask it now? Was it in regards to a slide that he already covered? Yes, it's um, and it's following the, um, the discussion that we've been having about MOT and the custodians. Yes. Um, Dr. Jackson has the task force and MOT. You, you talked about um, our MOT director talking about the logistics. Do we yet have an idea if it's logistically feasible with the staff that we have to do the cleaning at the um, at secondary schools? That's what's in process, uh, Board Member Lockerbie. I, th I think one of the uh, other uh, considerations for us is is to sit down to be able to have the conversations first and then identify what what the need is um and then and then bring back that um those outstanding issues uh to the board to the board we we solely focused on the big picture the macrocosm um and then we'll drill down on 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 some of those details because we felt like we had just a a little bit more time to to get those in place thank you dr jackson you're most welcome. And, and again, I just want to, I want to thank the, the, this task force because as Dr. Tarosian mentioned, we, we saw um, the situation, you know, evolving uh, before us exponentially. And so um, people answered the call and we ultimately ended up meeting, I think January, February, leading in the March uh, weekly. So uh, again, uh, hats off to um, everyone who's, who's sat on this task force. Um, so just, just to wrap the presentation up here, um, we've talked about the interest at, at the beginning of the presentation. And so we just wanted to highlight um, the interests that have been addressed, uh, the safety for all students, the staff, stakeholders, this alignment with the elementary school schedules as far as time span, um, embedded enrichment and intervention uh, within the day. You know, there was conversation about uh, providing that additional time even for our AP students who have testing uh, coming up. So um, teachers don't necessarily have to take a Saturday now to, to meet with students. Of course, they can if they, um, if they wish to because we know that they're dedicated. Um, but, but now that time is embedded. That continued focus on social emotional learning, siblings again for families, uh, making it feasible for them to get to and from uh, the sites. And then that key component, and I think it came up in, in one of the uh, community comments uh, early today, this, this focus on uh, equitable uh, learning opportunities. And again, it was really a think tank of people uh, putting their heads together uh, to come up with uh, this solution. Uh, next slide. So with this said, um, this is the secondary task force recommendation, the 90 minute block schedule. Uh, and together we cra crafted this final statement that we wanted to leave with the board, uh, as well as those viewers that are watching. Uh, considering all interest, the task force is recommending this three period 90 blocks scheduled day. We believe the schedule provides all Monrovia Unified students at the secondary level with the focus on equitable education in a safe and clean environment that addresses the social, emotional, and educational needs um, of our students. And so uh, with that said, we have one more slide. I just wanna talk to you about uh, the next steps, at least for the secondary task force, um, the week of March 15th, uh, pending uh, concerns here, recommendations from the board, uh, a webinar 
for input. The secondary task force is all, already aware of this uh, timeline. And so we'd be asking a few of them to, to sit on and present with me. Um, with that with that feedback then from the community, either the week of the 22nd or 29th approval uh, from the board, um, again, in the week of the 22nd of March, the commitment forms going out to parents determining they would like to be in the hybrid model in cohort A or B or remain 100% distance learning with the week of March 29th. Um, site administrators uh, working with support staff on the cohort assignments. And then um, April 12th and 13th, classroom prep. Uh, in the week of April 19th, stagger start. Now, again, these are, um, as Dr. Kaiser mentioned, there are asterisks next to each one of these. So uh, these are, are subject to change based on the feedback uh, we are receiving. So uh, I, I wanna make sure that people keep that uh, front, front and center. This is a tentative schedule. Next slide, final slide. Uh, again, uh, just wanted to thank the parents, students, teachers, classified staff members, and administrators who have volunteered and contributed uh, many hours to create in this hybrid model. Uh, the hybrid models that were presented this evening, we've spent much time together. Um, so I'm going to end it with this statement. I think uh, it was Dr. Z, principal of Santa Fe, who had uh, indicated that um, with the time that we've spent together um, and the team was in agreement, we all would love to get together um, as, as new friendships um, were fostered. We had some very challenging conversations, but very uh, respectful, even with our student members uh, coming to the table late, providing them opportunities to be um, articulate um, and provide input and insight from a, from a student's perspective. So thank you uh, to all, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, and uh, I echo your sentiments. Thank you very much to all the task force members, whether you were a parent, a teacher, a student representative, um, our union representatives, it, it, it was a collaborative effort. And I also want to personally thank Jennifer Anderson as being that board liaison to the task force. Um, she, she was in that role prior to becoming a board member. So it was really nice to have that continuity and, and, and have her continue in that capacity. So thank you to everybody. And now um, we can entertain questions. Any questions? We, I know we've had, a, uh, this presentation was lengthy. We've had the, um, the new HyFlex model for elementary schools. We've had Celsi. We've had the uh, hybrid learning pod uh, and other learning pod presentations and then secondary. So I'll just open it up for questions. Okay, I think I saw Celine first. Um, thank you, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll work backwards since it is just, um, I think the, just the previous slide or maybe the previous two slides where you were talking about the timeline, Dr. Jackson. Yes. And the, um, the tentative timeline um, seeks input and feedback from the community via a webinar around March 15th. Because this is secondary, um, I'd like clarification as to whose feedback we are seeking. We're, will there be student feedback why or why not? Uh, there will be student feedback. Dr. Tarosi and I uh, spoke earlier. Um, I think uh, board members are aware that uh, Dr. Tarosi and I visited um, with uh, student representatives uh, at Monrovia High School. Uh, didn't have the opportunity to do so at the middle schools, but we, we did so at the high school. And so there is a plan uh, to return. I, I gave our student representatives on our committee, our word that we we would return, um, we will uphold our word there, um, and then as well as um, that the community feedback as well. I think in, in the elementary task force, there were over 130 uh, questions that came forward, and over the last week or two, uh, cabinet and and directors and and team members have. Uh, individually been responding uh, to the questions to ensure 
uh, that we've answered most. And I think there may be just a couple left out there to, to address. Thank you. Um, I wanted to address in the secondary Wednesday schedule um, with it, your, it looks like the recommendation is to maintain um, seminar. Yes. From nine to 10, but it adds, um, if you could go back one more, Thank you. It adds the extension from 1015 to 1145. Um, I'd like more input on this at, you know, uh, at a later date, because currently the, um, the schedule has been seminar ends at 10 and uh, on Monday. And then at least my children proceed to asynchronous work. And they have so much asynchronous work. So if there is an extension to their day, I want to make sure that the asynchronous assignments are adjusted to accommodate for the extended teaching period in this day. Does that make sense? It does. And that, that was a part of our conversation as well. There needs to be uh, some balance, uh, Board Member Lockerbie. But again, uh, if, if you um, had an opportunity to see our agenda, we have some topics that are in the parking lot, and that's one of them. How do we balance the asynchronous work with the additional time uh, that students will, will be either online or in class? Great. Thank you so much for addressing that. Um, and then I, um, lastly, I wanted to point out something. And Ms. Huff, you don't have to go back to the slide, uh, but in your vaccine slide, when you were talking about um, the number of staff, the number of opportunities that have been offered. Um, I just wanted to, to mention that there are other opportunities for vaccinations, for getting vaccinations that you have offered to, to staff um, in addition to those things that you have lifted, uh, listed. So um, I just want to thank you for it, how hard you and your department have worked to give every opportunity that we have to our teachers and our staff to get vaccinated. So I just, I wanted to um, mention that and point that out. Thank you. I think, and I uh, thank you for, you know, addressing um, that component as well. Um, I mean, with multiple appointment calendars that, that we've been trying to balance with the, the various clinics that have been provided, I think our um, our staff members have been appreciative too because it, it, it has been confusing uh, at times. And so we're at a point now where um, our, our HR members are actually calling um, staff members individually and, and scheduling the appointments for them to limit codes being incorrect and things of that nature. Well, I know that it's not only my concern, but so much of the community is concerned about vaccination availability for teachers and staff. And I just wanted to make sure that I was very um, clear and appreciative of how hard you have worked to give every opportunity. So thank you again. Most welcome. Any other questions? All right, hey. I think we're good. Oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry. I thought Tracy had a question. Did, did Tracy have oh. her hand? Go on, Rob, you do. As oh, well, go on. Okay, thanks. I, I, I saw your hand and I was like, yes. I was waiting for you to come back <laughs> up. <laughs> um, um, I want to briefly go back and talk about the elementary plan. I know there was a lot of heated uh, discussion that happened after our um, special meeting. And I want to thank everybody who came in and addressed it and made the plan um, better. And the fact is, um, going to school for two hours a day, two days a week, needed to be better. And this is a much better plan. It, it meets the needs of the people who weren't being served at all, um, who we heard from uh, during the webinar. And I think it also meets the needs of the people who are planning on being in distant learning. They, they get more time. 
they get better time. This plan, that the 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 flex hybrid model, seems to meet the need of our community much better. I would like to thank the people that went back to the drawing board and redrew what was on the table. Um, and I, th I just wanted to thank you for that. I, it didn't go unnoticed. Um, sometimes it's very rough to watch the process and be a part of the process. But when it comes out and it serves people better, then it proves that the process is necessary. And as uh, Board President Trevanti had said, we appreciate the people who gave their input. Whether you agreed with the board or not, listening to you is an important part of our jobs. And just like in any organization or family, not everybody's gonna agree all the time, but we all agree about one thing, and that is we're here for the betterment of our students to make sure that they're getting the best education possible. And I do believe that this flex plan provides a better step. I also want to say, I'm gonna put my own asterisk on it. There is no perfect plan. And we cannot guarantee as a body that the plan that we're gonna be facing at the end of school will be the plan that's in place in August either. We don't know what's ahead of us. But we do know since the very beginning, since we walked out, I mean, we closed our schools last March, that we said we would be back when it was safe, that the people that we take direction from gives us the guidelines, we'll follow them, and we'll do it at the earliest possible moment. As we do know, the, the numbers are going down. The last report was 5.2 to 100,000. And that triggers all sorts of things happening. We want every family who wants to take advantage of whichever model that fits you best to take advantage of that model. And we wanna do it with the best interest of the student in mind when we do it. And I appreciate, I don't wanna say how I appreciate the board members. It is not easy taking heat. It just is not. And I, I just wanna remind the public that this is the same board that went and fought, I'm sorry, it's not the same people, but it's the same entity that went and fought to make sure that our kids could have a graduation. It, we do deeply care about what happens to the students that we see and are in our charge. Um, we take this position very, very seriously. So I just wanted to put that out there because it is very important to remember that we may not always agree on the decision that we come to, but we're, I do believe as a community, we're all working towards the same thing. I wanna get a clarification from Darwin because this is very important for families as well, that you have, you know, there will be a chance for people to sign up once the plan has been approved, for people to sign up for a, either um, at school or distant learning. But if you do not sign up for either, you will default to distant learning. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. I want to make sure everybody understands that. So if you really care about which one, then you need to put it down on a piece of paper and turn it in when the time comes. It's very important. And the other one is, because I've heard this since the very beginning, and I think Sarah is the one that brought it up to me, and it could have been last November when she brought it up, is do... And this, the flex model that's being presented this evening for the elementary and the secondary plan of the 90 minute block schedule, is it possible to make sure that the cohorts A and B are work together for elementary and secondary households? Um, that's a question to whoever can answer it. Okay, um, board member Hammond, I, I, the, the answer that we have, um, talked about doing is is arranging students by last name alphabetical because that would give us the best chance of um, getting students on the same page. Um, it's going to be quite a puzzle to do, to arrange this around 10 schools. And so um, that that is what we'll start with and we'll see how many families we can get on the same page with um, the last name alphabetical. And then there's going to be those at the end or the beginning of the lot that 
um, we may have to adjust a little bit differently. Okay. I, I'm very interested in how that works. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hammond, for bringing out some very important items. Um, any other, oh, Tracy, you were next. Thank you. This <laughs> is a mighty, mighty task and a huge lift to get us where we are and where we've come from to where we are. So uh, a, a tremendous amount of gratitude to all of the, the hours, the, the brain power, <laughs> uh, the conversations that have, have gone into getting us um, to this point. And, and I really say us because we're all in this together. Um, and so I, I am very grateful um, for the work that has gone on. Um, whether you served on the task force or not, you took the time to send the emails um, and all of that. That's all input, feedback, and us working together. I have to apologize up front. Sometimes I'm a little slow in processing things, okay? So you got to bear with me. I got a little more confused I think I got it, but I was a little more confused. And did I miss it that we are actually talking about simultaneous instruction on the part of the teachers that the cohorts A, two days, cohorts B, the other two days, the uh, Zoomers receiving their instruction from home, but there will be both happening the teacher will be addressing the ones in person as well as the Zoomers. So they will be instructing Zoomers and rumors either in, in both in the elementary flex model as well as the secondary three period a day model. Did, did I catch that or am I confused? Um, I think that they're a little bit different in the elementary and the secondary. So I can address the elementary model. Um, the way that the schedule is laid out, the first half hour where teachers are setting the sale for the day, that will be a time when the rumors and the Zoomer, Zoomers will be listening to the teacher all Together. at the same time because okay. the teacher is doing something that is very communal. The flag salute, the calendar. This is the objective for the day. This is the work that, it, that we're going to accomplish by the end of this day and bridging it from the day before. Because okay. that's always important for children to have it set up so that they remember what they did the day before. And then the rest of the day, there that's where the flexibility comes in where teachers are using their small group model to work with groups within the classroom and groups at home when the groups in the classroom are doing an independent task that's based on a lesson that the teacher just did, then she could work with, or he could work with the groups at home and then give independent work there, much like they run their small group model anyway in the classroom. Um, in a classroom, the, the, there are bulk times when um, teachers are doing full group in, in the elementary school, and then they're frequently breaking their class into those small groups to, to get students at their level. And so that will ensue during the elementary day, making that flexible. A teacher may be really comfortable doing the rumors and zoomers at the same time, and they may choose to do that throughout the day here and there, making their schedule very clear to their families and their students but that's not the, the crux of the model. It's, the, it's really based on the small group instruction. Does that I'm not sure that cleared my understanding, but it just may be me. So it just may be me. I, I don't know. I, I still see in that or hear in that, that Zoomers and rumors are being to some degree, involved with the teacher. Yes. Which seems to me simultaneous. Whether it, it's happening at the same time. That's... It is happening at the same time. So I'm working okay. six kids in my class, 
The other six are doing independent work and my 12 at home are doing independent work. Got it. Okay. A new group yeah. of six. Okay. So, okay. I, okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. okay. And then um, just an aside, going back to our last part of the conversation about um, clean, clean, cleaning and sanitizing in support of um, the custodial staff. I don't know, this is just a, a thought. Um, I had the fortune, misfortune of having to travel during this time of COVID to assist in the health and care of a, of a family member. I had to travel by plane, um, Delta specifically, not to plug them, but they really put themselves out there on reserving the middle seat, uh, cleaning and sanitizing between each flight and really pumping that up. One of the key things were, just in case you didn't really believe them, as you arrived onto the plane, they handed you an individual uh, sanitizing tile so that you could sanitize your area again. If, in, and there were many who whipped them out and did so. My point being, that is something that we should purchase with the monies that we have an abundance of individual sanitizing wipes that teachers can give to the students as they do, especially in the transition um, at the secondary from class to class that they can sanitize again their area to the, to the degree of their comfort knowing that the custodian staff has done so, but as a um, helpful measure if they choose to do so. So I'm just putting that out there. That's it for me. Thank you, uh, President. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, thank you very much. Good points. And I don't know if anybody wanted to address that. Are we equipped with, um, with those type of wipe sanitizers? Uh, probably Dr. Jackson can answer that a little bit better than I, but we did run into, we did uh, pursue that um, concept uh, a while back and hit a bit of a roadblock. Perhaps it's been lifted now, but it is about uh, providing students uh, with chemicals. Um, and so that that may be the impediment, perhaps there's a, a way around it and a different product that we can explore, but that that was definitely the impediment um, that we found as we were exploring that because we have been thinking about cleaning <laughs> for quite some time. Right, right. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Terosian. Um, any other comments? Uh, go ahead, Celine. Sorry, thank you. <clears throat> yes, I actually did want to make a comment um, and I wanted to comment to the public that is watching and I wanted to let them know that this is not the first time I or we have seen any of this. Uh, forgive me fellow board members if I say we, I'm not speaking for you, but uh, we, have been researching this and, and following this and asking questions about this and taking input about all, all of this since the very beginning. And um, uh, there, there's a, um, a, a, a quote about watching the sausage being made. Um, you know, sometimes we just maybe assume um, or forget that there are people out there that don't see the sausage being made or don't see the backstory or behind the scenes or what we have been working on. And I wanted to take this opportunity to let everybody know how hard we also board members have been working on this and have been informed on this and have been following this and have been asking questions about this. And this isn't the first time that I've seen what's here today. I've asked so many questions of so many people and 
still have more questions tonight. So thank you for the opportunity to let me share those comments with the public. Thank you, Ms. Lockerbie. Well, as board president, you go last. So I, <laughs> I, um, I do have a question and it's regarding the technology uh, page of this presentation where it details the different devices that are being issued out to teachers. Can we go to that slide, please? There we go. Whoop, go back. Go back one more. There we go. Okay, so in the next steps, um, I understand part of the plan was to have a couple of down days for teachers so that they could, one, prepare their classrooms and they will be receiving, the, I, I want to say on the timeline, it was the week of March 15th, they will be receiving new upgraded devices in the form of computers and tablets, these document cameras, speakers, and microphones. So um, they will need time to, you know, get used to and set up these uh, new devices. Um, from what I understand from the original presentation, when the board approved the purchase of all these items, is that the new laptops will have upgrade, upgraded systems and they will have a, lap, uh, a tablet so that if they choose to walk around the classroom, they could zoom from the tablet. And that was kind of the, myth, the thinking behind purchasing the tablets in addition to the devices. So I just wanna make sure that they will have these additional tools and they definitely will need time to, to get these running, get familiar and set up their classroom. So that is exciting that we're even talking about this a year later, I, I'm, I'm beside myself. So Charles, I know you, you put your video on, but if you wanted to add anything else to that on uh, as far as the technology. Yeah, so uh, I put my video on because I thought there was going to be a question. Uh, but one thing I will clarify is that we, we did give teachers um, the option. Uh, not, not every, you know, we did hear feedback that, that there's a possibility that not every um, teacher wanted a tablet. Gotcha. That that many 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 years ago, before my time, that uh, a lot of teachers got tablets, and many of them were, weren't being used to their full potential. So we did give the options for a teacher to pick a, a laptop and a tablet, um, but if they chose not to pick the tablet, they can choose to upgrade their laptop with a, a slightly higher processor and more memory. So um, those that picked the tablet got a tablet. Some of them did not pick a tablet. Um, and the same thing with document cameras. We know that some teachers may use to uh, want to use the, the tablet as a document camera or, or you know, because with a document camera, you're using it on a, on a usually a, a, a physical medium. You know, you're, you're demonstrating a, a, something you know, like a paper or something to putting up on a screen. And there are some teachers that can get by without a document camera. Um, they, they've fully transitioned to all digital. So not every teacher opted for a document camera either. So we do we did try to serve the, the teachers in, in allowing them to pick uh, what they, you know, were going to use in their classroom. All right. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for explaining that. Uh, Tracy, did you have something? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious in the timeline of that, was that our current reality we were living in when those questions were posed? And those selections uh, and choices made, or was this a previous to our current reality? Uh, it was a little bit of both. You know, we were talking about um, hybrid learning, uh, live streaming a little bit, but at the same time, we weren't sure what hybrid learning and live stream would, would look like. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, one was, uh, you know, we had some discussions around microphone. What type of microphone did we, we really need? You know, was the microphone on the laptop good enough? Um, there's also a microphone on a tablet. Is that going to be good enough? And uh, we are actually, you know, still going to be doing some testing. Um, we may want to purchase some additional microphones. So, so we are doing a little bit of uh, some refining to it. Uh, but the core is there, which is the computers, the, the tablets that those that have opted for it, as well as the document cameras, um, as well as computer speakers, because we do have aging computer speakers, which... We're planning to, um, you know, point them at, in a certain manner um, so that uh, the kids can hear and so that we can uh, have boomers and Zoomers. Oh, okay. So if I could graciously ask 
that as we get closer to approaching a final approval of the model that we're going to implement, that we ask that question yet again. Just because once the much is known, I may have a different response knowing what I will have to uh, do as a teacher, uh, knowing that I'm gonna be simultaneously working with rumors and Zoomers. I may now respond differently in terms of what my instructional needs might be. Mm -hmm. okay. Is that possible, uh, President Travanti? I, I, it's definitely possible. I just don't know about the inventory that we would have that we purchased with the CARES Act money that, that had to be used up by December. So I'm, I'm not, I mean, we can canvas what the needs are now. I just don't know how quickly we could supply those needs. But Charles, maybe you can speak a little bit more about, did we order yeah. some extra? I was thinking of a couple things. I mean, if, if a teacher were to say, I, I need a, a different type of laptop, uh, that mm -hmm. that would be difficult. Uh, we, we'll pass the return period on that. Uh, on the other hand, if, if there's a, a part that we hadn't considered, like I need an adapter for this, that may be $20 per teacher, that's something that we can definitely look in. That, that's kind of how I was seeing the question. So for things like that, that's something as we discover, um, you know, we would, I would bring up the cabinet to figure out how we can make, make that happen. Um, and just as a heads up, this this Friday, uh, we are actually planning to do a little bit of a test at Brad Oaks. We're going to have some instructional coaches going at Brad Oaks, uh, testing net, network so I can do a real measurement. I am planning to to bring a, a, a MacBook, a, a PC, a Chromebook, and, and just to come run some different tests. And we may find something out with that test that maybe we're missing some adapters. Um, so, you know, we are, are we, we find the process as we go. Okay, thank you. I think that would be a good idea to go ahead and send, survey the, the teachers on that. So thank you, Tracy, for bringing that up. Um, Dr. Terosian, I believe you wanted to wrap up this presentation and then we're probably, we've gone kind of late. We probably need to give folks a little bit of a break. Correct. And if we could just go to the slides where we left off, I have two or three more simply to, to finish up. And as we get there, just uh, I kept hearing some words over and over again, and that is trying to give flexibility, trying to give choice, trying to, to make sure that we are meeting the needs of, of many. And, and that's how we started this year, you know, grace and flexibility, allowing one another and um, assuming good intent, uh, offering grace and flexibility, whatever model we implement, it will be imperfect and uh, the implementation will be imperfect. And uh, we started distance learning that way and we got better and we'll continue to improve. This is an organization that continues to learn and grow and uh, it has been exciting to see. Uh, a couple of very briefly, AB, uh, Assembly Bill 86, the in-person instruction grant was passed on Friday. And while there's still much for us to learn about it and much that I need to, to read, uh, there will be some additional money to each district. There will be a penalty of 1% uh, of that money for each day that we are not open between April 1st and May 15th, uh, and a forfeiture of all funds if we do not open by May 15th. Uh, just, uh, I, I'll provide some additional information about this as we move forward, but I, I did want you to be aware of that. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, uh, prioritizing the in-person instruction for students. And this, these are um, some of those most vulnerable populations for whom we have begun crafting uh, nets and supports. Uh, I believe, is there one more slide? There we go. And I, 
simply talking about getting to the red tier and all schools would be allowed to be opened in the red tier. Uh, and we are getting there. Uh, we are probably a week away from being in the red tier. Uh, and that just says that we are healthier as a community and I, I am grateful for that. And that concludes uh, the presentation. I wanna thank the board for your patience in listening in attentively and asking so many uh, appropriate questions in, about the models, the plans, and the many, many supports. Thank you, Dr. Trozian. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser, Dr. Jackson, um, Tom McFadden, all those that presented today. Um, there was a lot of information, but it was needed. Um, I think there's a lot more clarity now. I, I, I know for sure some of the questions that were asked earlier in public comments were addressed through this presentation. Um, however, of course, you'll still receive your response if you submitted a public comment. Um, but I am hopeful. I hope the rest of the board is feeling hopeful. I, re I, I really hope that the parents out there and the teachers and administrators are feeling hopeful as well. And we all miss the kids. We wanted to make sure that it was equitable between the in-person cohorts and the ones in distance learning and that teachers had time for prep time and um, there was just an across the board interest-based plan. So I'm, I'm very pleased. I'm very happy. Sometimes you reach really high. Um, I definitely took some heat this week and that's okay. Um, and I knew we were going to come up with a happy medium. I knew that there was another way to add some time for our families that need, need to opt into the in-person um, and have more time there. So thank you very much for the hard work, Dr. Terosian, Dr. Kaiser. I know that you dove in deep and along with the task force members. This is what we needed. I really, really appreciate it. And with that, I think we need to take a, a five minute. How much time does the board need? Five, 10 minutes? Three or four minutes, five minutes, it's fine. Can we shoot for five? Go five. Okay. Let's, but shoot, let, let, let's, let's uh, encourage the public to return for the Yes, please. Please. <laughs> please do return. Please return. There's a lot more great information um, and things to consider coming up here quickly. So five minutes, come on back and we'll recess.
Thank you. Uh, we return. We're going to open back the meeting from recess. And thank you for those uh, viewing from the public that you're hanging in there with us. We have really some very important items to go over. Um, there was a public comment that was inadvertent miss inadvertently missing. and we want to make sure that it is read out loud. So uh, Ms. Huff, if you could go ahead and read that comment and then we'll move on on the agenda. Sure. Um, that comment came from Amy Fang. Uh, Ms. Fang writes, good evening school board. Thank you for reading my public comment. I am concerned with the last board meeting. We couldn't come to a consensus about the hybrid plan and don't have much time left for teachers to prepare. Board members were saying that parents want school open for full days, but I don't think people realize what other districts are doing. Very few pub public schools nearby are doing full day hybrid. Glendora and Arcadia have hybrid plans similar to what the task force originally proposed. When we talk about working parents, many cannot go back to work even with, an, even with any hybrid program until after school programs open fully. The YMCA is closed, the Boys and Girls Club takes fewer students than before, and Village closes earlier, so with two days a week from 8.30 to 2 versus the original plan of 12.30 to 2.30 help many full-time working parents. Since no hybrid plan is ideal, I feel it is important for students to ease into a hybrid model for the remaining school year with the original two-hour plan because it is the best plan for both in-person and online students. Our MUSD task force worked hard to take into account all students. If we go to a full day model, what about the 40% of families who want distance learning and who are happy with it? I and others were happy to hear in our district that the morning block of instruction would remain the same. My children know the morning routine and it's working for many due to the culture the teachers have created. Hearing about easing into hybrid for the afternoon while maintaining the schedules that have been created made many of us happy. Also, the state mandates daily live instruction for all students, including the online students. So please consider what the task force originally created. I appreciate all of the time and effort that went into the plan because it takes into consideration all students, including those staying online. Please consider the task force's original plan. Sincerely, Amy Fang. Thank you, Ms. Fang. I appreciate uh, your comments. And again, we apologize for not reading it earlier in the meeting. Um, board members will receive a copy of your public comment. We'll move on to consent agenda. Routine items of business placed on the consent agenda have been carefully screened by members of the staff. And we do have two items from the consent agenda that will be moved to action items. And that, uh, that is the Los Angeles County Office of Education contract um, or PBIS. And then also um, board policy 5144. Thank you. The board policy um, is being moved to the action item list. So um, can I get a Motion and a second on the consent agenda items with those two items being pulled. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Ms. Ruff, uh, Ms. Huff, can you call the roll? Board member Anderson. Yes. Board member Golar. Yes. Board member Lockerbie. Yes. Board member Hammond. Yes. Board president Travanti. Yes. Motion carries five zero. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Huff. And now we will move to, um, we're moving up this item and as soon as I find the item, then I can read to it. Okay, the board discussion to rename the Monrovia High School Welcome Wellness Center in memory of Susan Hirsch. Um, we'll invite uh, Kirk McGinnis to go ahead and speak on, on this particular item. And, and thank you for hanging out with us so long this evening. Oh, absolutely. Uh, good evening, President Travanti, members of the board, Dr. Tarosian, cabinet members, and of course, members of our community. It is uh, with great honor and privilege that I speak to you tonight uh, to share this wonderful recommendation. On behalf of the staff of Monrovia High School, we would like to formally request that the Monrovia Unified School Board review and approve this request to name the Monrovia High School Wellness Center in memoriam of Susan Hirsch. 
the Susan Hirsch Wellness Center. As you may know, Susan was hired in March of 1986 as a special education teacher assigned to Brad Oaks. Since then, she has held eight different titled positions in Monrovia Unified at various sites, including intervention coordinator, director of academic intervention, principal of the adult school and parent education, and in 2016 at Monrovia High School as intervention coordinator. Her dedication to the social, emotional, and academic support of our Monrovia students and their families has been a hallmark of her 34 years of service. The establishment of the Wellness Center at Monrovia High School was one of her most recent and notable accomplishments, bringing her extensive community activism and partnerships in the mental health community to join with Monrovia Unified School District to provide support and resources to MHS students and their families. The Wellness Center has become a model for other districts to replicate and will continue to serve the needs of our students. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much, Mr. McGinnis. Uh, Dr. Trozian, I believe you also wanted to say a few words. Yes, uh, board clerk uh, Golar had actually first brought this to the board for consideration and had been something that had been discussed on the Monrovia High School campus. I, I, I know that we had brought to the board uh, a, a, a need to really update our board policy regarding the naming and the renaming of any facility. Um, but the Wellness Center is one where uh, Susan gave her heart and soul to it. It, was, uh, it permeated her being and, and really uh, lives through, well, not just that place, but in all of our hearts. Uh, Mr. McGinnis actually referred to her in the present tense, and it reminds me of how she really does seem to always be here. So I, I encourage the board to, to adopt this and, and probably uh, board clerk Golar might want to say a couple of words to that effect as, as it was uh, her initiation of this. Absolutely, go ahead, Tracy. I really, I don't know what to say because I'm just gonna start crying. So <laughs> I'll be really brief. Um, you know, as we, as, as we have worked through some of the difficulties of decision-making for our current realities, this one right here is an opportunity to do what is really the spirit of who we are as a, as a, as a community, as a school community. And that is honor the, the work, the service, the spirit of who we are as a school district, as well as a community. And so what other way than uh, honoring the legacy of, of Susan Hirsch? So I'm gonna leave it like that because I don't want to cry, <laughs> but uh, know that it is with heartfelt emotion that I, I urge the board to, to do this, to support the, the interests uh, of the of the Monrovia High School campus um, and all of the folks there, but also um, it's going to do well for us overall, not just the school, but the whole school community. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. I'd like to add that when I first became a board member, I had heard about our wellness center, but I didn't have any, you know, firsthand knowledge. I didn't, I hadn't been over to it. So um, through Dr. Terosian, I was able to schedule an appointment with uh, Susan and she was so eager um, to walk me through that wellness center. She spent at least an hour and a half with me, showing me every single aspect of that wellness center and the, the pride and the love and the passion that she showed. It just, it went through me. And I've been carrying it ever since. And I, I, I just love the way she spoke about her partnerships, the organizations, the, the, the students that have gone through, the services provided, and 
she was excited about it, a new room they just created that was going to be kind of a workshop room for parents and and students and just I, I just I can't imagine um, you know not naming the wellness center after her. Just wanted to share that. Rob. Um, I, I, I feel like Tracy. I'm normally not at a loss for words, but the, the night we closed our meeting in, in her memory, it was very tough. And tonight, well, I can say this. Anybody who met Susan Hirsch in person received a hug from Susan Hirsch. And it's a thing you'll never forget because I have never met anybody who drew you so close when you got a hug. And I hope my vote tonight is my way of hugging Susan one more time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can I have a motion and a second? I think it should be Tracy. I move, I so move. Second. Second, we have a motion and a second. Ms. Um, any additional discussion? Ms. Huff, can you call the vote, please? Board Member Golar? Resounding yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Absolutely. Board Member Hammond? Yes. Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board President Trevanti? Yes. yes. Motion carries 5-0. All right, thank you very much. I'm only sorry that it ended up so late on a very busy night, but um, truly, truly glad that we've done this. And Tracy, thank, thank you again for bringing this forward. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. McGinnis, appreciate it. All right, let me get back in order here. Um, we are now on action item. Sorry, we got out of order a lot in this agenda. I think we're, so. doing, <laughs> I think we're doing the PBIS from consent. All right. Yes, thank you very much. We'll move into the PBIS, which was moved off of consent into action. And I believe Dr. Kaiser, are you presenting on this one? Thank you, Dr. Jackson. And yes. Oh, thank you, <laughs> Dr. Jackson, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Uh, the board is at, at <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Board President Trevante, members of the board, Dr. Tarosian, members of the community and cabinet. Uh, the Board of Education is requested to approve a contract with the Los Angeles County of Education for positive behavior interventions and supports, consulting and training services from July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 22. Um, the positive behavior interventions and supports training offered by the Los Angeles County Office of Education provides district schools a comprehensive three-tier training comprised of professional development, coaching, and networking. Combined, this three-tier training will support and build upon the previous training provided by Ed Services, thereby galvanizing their PBIS program towards full implementation um, at their school site. The cost per school is approximately 4,500 per year for an estimated total of 45,000, which is covering our, our 10 sites. This expense will be paid for from supplemental and concentration funds as part of the LCAP, Go 3 allocation. Okay, any questions for Dr. Jackson? I have a question. Ms. Lockerbie. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Jackson. Um, this agenda item mentions PBIS, um, and I, I know it's about the training for PBIS, but it doesn't really go into detail about what PBIS is. Can you please elaborate for our public what PBS, PBIS is, the, 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 the concept that it's 
replacing and what are what are our expected incomes using this model of behavior modification? Will do. So it, it's not replacing, it's, it's serving as a complement. Uh, and it's lying to research that states building, teaching, uh, rewarding expectations results uh, in change behavior versus uh, solely punitive measures. Uh, as I just mentioned, it, it doesn't replace progressive discipline, it complements it. And also provides a structure to explicitly teach behavior expectations with opportunities of other means of correction before moving into uh, serious consequences. And that's been the focus within our district for the um, last couple of years. Um, this entails combination of counseling support, um, you know, conversation with the kid, just having given them some reflective time. Uh, could be, you know, campus service. Some people respond uh, to that and parents are supportive of that. Bringing parents. Um, into the process and, and having a conversation. You, you can learn a lot about a kid based on what they're experiencing and, and what those triggers uh, might be. Um, and then it, the tiers that exist, you know, tier one, uh, focus on uh, supporting all students. And then as you move up the tiers, tier two, uh, focusing more on uh, a smaller group of students that may be exhibiting more at risk behaviors. And then you have that tier three, which is um, very strategic supports for uh, individual students who are who have been identified uh, most at risk. Tracy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Um, a couple of things. Um, I imagine, um, according to what our board item says, that this has been in uh, implementation mode for the past at least five years or so, right? Or maybe yeah. longer, right? Yes. Um, so, so I imagine that each campus is in a different level or stage, if you will, of implementation. What I'd like to ask is if we could have added to our pending board issues where we have reports or presentations, right, um, added to that timeline of some point, a report and update of exactly where the campuses are with regards to uh, implementation of PBIS. That makes sense? Duly noted. Okay, because I, you know, there's there's your one, there's your two, there's your three, there's full implementation, you know, and I, I won't get into the to the weeds of what each year looks like, but it would be really wonderful to really understand um, where we are so that we can leverage and get gain the most um, out of the training that is provided at LACO. That's okay. my first thing. Second, um, I don't know whose department this would come under. I guess it's, it's you, Dr. Jackson. But in order to really get um, effective implementation of PBIS, the allocation of time as a resource for planning and collaboration for purposes of implementing the site team's plan. There's some time built in when they go to LACO, but that's not sufficient. There has to be time carved out in either the pupil free days or, or somewhere that site teams are allocated planning time for um, really crafting their model of implementation. So just getting the training from LACO is not sufficient. It's great as a starter, but the resource of time and collaboration time and planning 
for the site teams is greatly needed. And I can work with the sites on creating um, a schedule that reflects that time embedded in uh, the year, the month, et cetera, that shows the ongoing progression and incorporation of that PBIS. As you indicated, that's the only way you're, you're, we're gonna be effective um, in implementing the strategies. Yeah, and I got one more and then I'll let it go. PBIS is wonderful and I have recognized it in my past work in terms of it being the structures that rewards and acknowledges positive behavior, right? And the continuation of that. I'd also like to see it coupled with the elevated functioning of restorative practices because bringing those two pieces together allows for the building of more emotional intelligence in terms of our children, in terms of their social emotional development. Julie noted. Okay, I'm done now. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Any other comments? Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, and this is an actual question. Uh, is restorative justice something that can be built into PBIS? Or is or is it somehow I, I, I don't understand how how that can be woven together? It can be. It can be. It it lends as a support. Okay. Um, so it's an additional part of positive learning support structure right behavior mod that sort of thing okay okay are we good all right then um because this was moved to action item um we are going to take a vote on this and i'll need a motion in a second and tracy if you could do the motion with your added language um, oh boy <laughs> okay I move to approve the continuation of professional development training for PBIS with LACO with the ask that we have a report for the update of where each campus is with regards to its implementation and that we also work to increase the alignment of restorative practices with implementation of PBIS. Very good. I agree. Yeah. Do I have a second? I will second. Okay, Celine, second. Ms. Uh, Huff, can you call the roll? Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Ms. Lockerbie? Did you not hear me? Yes. No, you were <laughs> muted. Sorry, I don't, sorry. <laughs> Board Member Hammond? Yes. Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board Member Golar? Yes. Board President Trevanti? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Okay, thank you, Ms. Huff. Move on to our next uh, action item in educational services School Accountability Report Card or SARCs for Monrovia Unified School District. Dr. Kaiser. This is actually Dr. Jackson's item also. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Jackson. Sorry, Board President Trevanti. Um, can you reiter reiterate uh, your policy? Sorry. Dr. Dr. Kaiser, um, the school accountability report cards will be done by Dr. Jackson. Oh, I thought it was the policy. I excuse me. No, I have the board policy. No, no, no. We're, I know it's late, but okay. I, I was. Okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. I, I saw <laughs> Dr. Kaiser. Okay. <laughs> yes, I, I have my wits about me now. 
<laughs> um, board President Tre Trevanti board. Tonight, um, we have the school accountability report cards known as the SARCs. Um, and the Board of Education is requested to approve the board, the school accountability report cards for each of the following schools. Brad Oaks Elementary um, Science Academy, Mayflower Elementary School, Monroe Elementary School, Plymouth Elementary School, Wild Rose School of Creative Arts, Clifton Middle School, Santa Fe Computer Science Magnet School, Monrovia High School, Canyon Oaks High School, and Mountain Park School for the 2020-2021 academic school year. The board shall annually approve the SARCs for each school in the district and evaluate the data contained in the SARC as part of the board's regular review of the effectiveness of the district's program. And then these are posted on our website um, and it's part of a, a requirement from CDE, the California Department of Education. Any questions for Dr. Kaiser? Okay, I'll entertain a motion in a second. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? Ms. Huff, can you call the roll please? Board Member Hammond? Yes. Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board Member Golar? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board President Trevanti? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Kaiser. Yeah. We'll move on to the new course offering for high school students, Popular Singing. This is also you, Dr. Kaiser. Yes, it is. Um, the, the Board of Education has requested to approve Popular Singing as a new course offering for high school students. As part of the Monrovia Unified School District Career Technical Education Program and in keeping with our LCAP goal 1.6 to increase the number of students who successfully enter and complete high school, college and career ready and increasing the enrollment in higher level courses, this music course is being presented for approval. Development of basic techniques and skills appropriate for singing various styles of commercial and popular music. Emphasis will be on singing techniques, song interpretation, and the joy of performing. Some music um, technology and the business of music will also be discussed. Solo and ensemble singing performances will be included. This course description has been adopted from Citrus College's catalog course description for Music 100. And it is a semester long course that will earn Monrovia Unified School District students two units of transferable college credit while simultaneously earning five units of elective credit at Monrovia High School. This course at um, the Citrus College is part of our Citrus College partnership and Citrus College will be paying for the instructor for this course. And it will be somebody who is qualified to teach at the junior college level. Um, there are no associated costs for this course and the high school is planning on making this a seventh period course as, as a, an extracurricular activity course after school that will be a, a great complement for our musical theater program. Um, one of the issues that we have is that our musical theater program is award-winning it wins more awards than any musical theater program in the San Gabriel Valley. And in order to keep it at that level, there needs to be a pipeline of training for the kids in their vocals to go along with the drama in the drama department. And this course would help the students to achieve that. And so um, this is, this is a, a class that is under the umbrella of our early college program. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Any questions? Uh, Tracy, I think I saw your hand go up first. No, no, I'm going to defer to Ms. Anderson. I'll oh. go after. I've been doing a lot of talking. I'll okay. go after. Thank you, Mrs. Ms. Guller. <laughs> uh, very, very briefly. Um, 
so this is to to help um, enhance our musical theater program. If there should be students that are not in our musical theater program that would also like to enroll in this class, will they be allowed to do so? Or is it, I think you just answered my question. <laughs> it's a very open class. And you know, one of the concerns that we have with our early college classes, there's a level of rigor with most of them that we don't want students to just willy-nilly take because if they take it and fail it, then that is on their college transcript as well as their high school transcript. So we want them to be very careful in selecting it. This course is one that is a performance course. It's fun. The risk of failure is very low. Um, attendance would be the biggest thing for them to attend and participate. And we're planning on this attracting the students that are in that program. And then there are students that just want to learn how to sing pop popular music. This is not a choral course that teaches the specifics of choir singing or madrigal singing or some of those other techniques. This is a popular singing class. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. I okay, do. Tracy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Um, I'm going to use a technical term here, everybody. So hold on. This is awesome. This is just really, really getting to um, what would draw students' attention and engagement um, and serve a lot of checkpoints uh, in terms of a course being offered. I see that it is transferable in terms of the C, uh, CSU. My wonderment is how can we, or is there a provision for it to be um, A through G in terms of the uh, F requirement uh, for UC? And I say that because this would also lend itself, if so, to, um, you know, our athletes who are in pursuit of scholarships in terms of the 16 courses needed for the NCAA Clearinghouse. So I think this would be a very popular offering. And if there is some way to uh, get it to be on the UC approved list, A through G for MHS, I think we would win, win, win all the way across. We're only going to win-win with this one, board member Golar. Yes. <laughs> but we're not going to win-win-win. It's not a triple. And the reason is this course belongs to Citrus. I, I've asked all of these mm -hmm. questions, so I have the answers on my lips. Um, and I, Because I did not have the answers to these questions. Um, the course doesn't belong to us. If it belonged to us, we could rewrite it to meet the, the requirements. It belongs to Citrus. And it's a course that will meet the needs of this. It's a particular need. It's not a general need. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's one issue. The other issue is that it is a two-unit course at the college. And for it to be A through G, it would need to be a three-unit course at the college. And so then one of the questions came, well, can't Citrus give us one of their three-unit classes? Citrus has an award-winning music program, and you know, they have the Citrus Singers and their Madrigals. They save those courses at those levels for that level of singing at mm -hmm. Citrus. And it also wouldn't meet the need that we're experiencing with our musical theater program. There's one more thought behind this that was driving the, the engine in, in creating this. There was a need expressed at the high school. We need to have this type of training. Where are we going to get it? This is a great way to get it. Um, in Monrovia, Monrovia is very unique in many ways. And one of the things that's unique in Monrovia, um, we offer uh, an award-winning quality musical theater program in Monrovia from TK all the way to adult. And, you know, when this class and the, all the challenges are what made me think of, you know, what is this? Um, 
at Wild Rose, we have an award-winning musical theater program. You heard all about Sharon Noggle tonight, that those kids have performed on the Amundsen stage. That's highly unusual. TK to fifth grade, they've been on that stage. And then at Clifton, we have you know, an extracurricular musical theater program where they're putting on things like the high school musical junior that, that's phenomenal. At the high school, the, our high school program, when they performed in the Heights, they won more Jerry Herman awards than the, the School of the Performing Arts that's at Cal State LA, the big LOXA school, the fame school. They won more awards than that school did. And I know that school because my son went there. And I, I thought, wow. And to top it off, our adults in our community perform in our community theater. So in the city of Monrovia, we have a signature program that is a big signature. And we want to keep feeding that and meeting the needs of, as, as well as looking at where are the other gaps in our performing arts and when can we add those in a logical time span so that we build other things out that are also successful. Um, and so this course is a very specific course meeting a very specific need in a kind of a creative way with the partnership that we have with Citrus. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Kaiser. Um, ready for a motion here, motion and a second, please. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Ms. Huff, roll. Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board Member Golar? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board Member Hammond? Yes. Board President Trevanti? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kaiser. We'll move on to uh, business services with Connie Wu, the second interim report for the 2021 fiscal year. Good evening, President Trovanti, Board of Education, Superintendent Dr. Tarosian, Kevin, and uh, um, all the community members are still with us tonight. Um, Ed Coder required the district to sum, submit at least twice for Board of Education to certify the district financial responsibility to, to pay its uh, um, financial obligations. Next slide, please. So this will be the second time. The first time is board approved the first interim report in December. This will be the second time. And tonight, the business service department requests the board and to approve the positive certification, which means that the district will be able to meet our financial obligation for current year as well as next two years. So there's three um, certification and um, positive is good. The qualify, which means that the district um, may not meet our financial responsibility current and next two years. The next, the negative doesn't mean that we were not able, um, able to meet. Next slide, please. So what is the changes? You know, a board aware of that since um, May revision of last year and towards the June adopt budget for this year and the state, uh, the governor adopt state budget and the first interim, the public school district budget is like a roller coaster. We have a core change a couple of times so the, the there is changes in the second interim compared with previous guideline. And I will list the more detail in the uh, next couple of slides. And the district also adjusts our budget for the mom money. Mom money is we normally did not budget, we only budget as we receive the money because of timing and the, the how much the dharma we will receive. So in order to make sure budget more accurately, we just budget as we receive the money. And also we did a, a one classification for the first round of character money because when the money first come out, uh, the use of the money, the accounting is not clear. Now when time come by, there's a more clear um, accounting and treatment for those uh, first round of character money. So we reclassify the money. The digital still have money, just accounting reclassif reclassification, make sure it's more meet the requirement. Next slide, please. 
So here are some um, changes. The main is Cora. The uh, enrollment projection and ADA projection has not changed. As board uh, recall that uh, um, the state did give us the whole harmless for the um, attendance um, in January for the revenue because of the distance learning. So the major change is Cora for, for the first intern, zero Cora. For the adult budget, negative Cora. But for the second intern, for the next year, there's 3.84% for LCSFF. The rest of the program is 1.5%. But the year later, instead of zero, there's 1.28%. And just uh, um, there's extra here. There's a different version uh, regarding the COLA projection. The district uses the most conservative version, which is uh, um, provided by School Service of California. Next slide, please. So here is the unrestricted general fund revenue. Um, the district has received revenue from a certain part and the LCF is our majority of revenue and over the three years and from 51 million to 53 million and the board will see the 22, 23 is down to 51 million. It is because of ADA. Uh, 22, 23, there's no longer hold harmless for the ADA due to the distance learning. So as a result, we will receive less money because of declining enrollment. And as board recall, I did not have a federal income because we reclassify federal income to categorical program, which is restrict program. So here we only talk, up, talk about unrestrict. So also the, the revenue, we um, again, we including the projection for my money and we adjust down the interest and income as well, recall that uh, right now interest is very low, including the legal treasure compared with a good time is also lower. So we adjust accordingly, and uh, we we barely have any rev, um, rental lease income right now because of the social distance because of school closure. Next slide, please. So this is the traditional part, and uh, for the expenditure. The expenditure side, we're also including the unrestricted or restrict because there is um, interference transfer. So in order to present a more better picture, so we combine the general fund and uh, um, salary and benefit is still the majority of our budget and it's um, around 80%. This percentage is in align with our first intern. Our district normally 80 to 84%, depend, depend on whether we have a big ticket item if we have a textbook adoption, then the, um, this percentage will be a little bit lower. So books of supply is 7% and operation is around uh, um, 11%. And uh, the other two items is, is uh, um, less than 1%. Next slide, please. So this is the multi-year projection I mentioned to the board that uh, when the board adopt in the adult budget back to June because of the negative quota. So we end up have a um, negative ending from the balance um, over 12 million because of the required 3% set aside and the non-expandable. So we end up of other from the balance, which means is the supporting our operation is negative 14 million. Next slide, please. Our multi-year projection getting better because why when the first intern report, the, the governor said that the quarter projection is 0% across the board. Because of that, our financial situation um, did become better. And uh, with the board support, board recall that we are strategically use care act money to support the balance our budget. We had a, um, at least two um, conversation with the, uh, with the board. So, at the end of first interim, our um, other fund balance is a uh, uh, negative $1.8 million. So next slide, please. Here is today, the multi projection we ask board approval. Because of the quota 3.84%, as well as over 1.6%, that multi-year percentage quota will help us a lot. So as a result, uh, our we um, we're no longer in red. Our infinite uh, balance uh, for support operation um, after we met adequate three percent set aside, 
we will end up with 1.4 million dollars at the third year, which is 22 and 23 school year. Next slide, please. So here's a list of the fund. And general fund is our major operation fund. We also have adult education, child development, um, food service, and the fee-based fund. So those funds basically, they should uh, um, self-support. And that is why um, board know that um, with your support, we are very conscientious about food service since COVID-19. We make sure that we promote our program, make sure that uh, the, that fund is still solid. And as of right now, all those fund is, is solid for the um, for current year. We will expand, uh, we will anticipate when we close the book of this year, those fund will have a positive any fund balance. Next slide, please. And this is the cash deferral um, from the state um, per the border uh, request from prior board meeting. The um, preliminary budget for the in January did resent some of the cash deferral, which is next school year. However, this school year, starting last month, certain deferral has already been taken effective. And so, however, I'm very happy to report board, although the board did provide the district flexibility to pass the resolution for each train in April. We did not uh, um, join the other district to issue train. The reason is uh, we look at uh, the other fund, um, various fund, we have a decent reserve, um, cash reserve in other fund. So we were able to uh, save our $27 cost for mm -hmm. each train then we will strategically close monitor from now on and close monitor our cash in and out. This including strategically make sure that we pay the bill within the 30 day payment term and make sure that we set a specific, we will set aside a certain dollar amount, make sure that we will make the payroll in, in June. So that is the state cash deferral schedule, the money, bag move, which means February, it's it's the first delay and of last payment, which means November will be pay, paid. Next slide, please. So um, after the board approved the positive certification for the for a second interim report, we will, um, we will meet the adequate requirements submitted to the county by March 15. And uh, um, as the board already discussed various model of uh, reopening schools, reopen school, there is a money ticket item behind this. We talk about the PPE facility ready and talk about the supplies and the cleaning. So, uh, so we were very conscientious to budget correctly and purchase correctly. We're not interested in purchasing a various item and sitting in the warehouse. That is not uh, um, financially res uh, responsible. We make sure that we have enough um, PPE to support uh, um, our operation, but not much extra. So we, um, um, Dr. Torres also mentioned that the AB, SB 86 required school reopening, there's two part of money, but the rural regulation did require the district um, get the board approved before June um, uh, for the how we spend this money. So I'm pretty sure what cabinet uh, uh, will submit to the um, board or Dr. Torosian will submit submit the board the plan uh, later. Uh, once the May revision come out and uh, um, to me, I'm very anxious to see what is the May revision code uh, assumption because it may change again. Um, you know, any changes in the south and go to south, then it will put our budget upside down. So I'm very anxious to see what it is uh, that looks like. Um, and then um, as our regular uh, schedule, we will, um, in the first board meeting, we will hold a public hearing for the adult budget as well as uh, um, an LCAP. And then the second board meeting in June, we will submit a board for adoption for next year's budget. So that will end my second interim report presentation and any question from the board. Any questions? Ms. Anderson? Thank you, Ms. Wu. Um, if, uh, you might not need to go back to the, the, the deferral rainbow. 
Um, but if we're getting February's money in November, do we also get our November money at that time? Or are they going to be deferring that as well? Uh, right now, there's no deferring plan in November 2021. So, so I assume that it will um, on schedule. But again, plan can change. So as I mentioned that uh, if the governor made revision, he has a he has also to make change again. But I hope it is not. So we're hopeful that in addition to the deferral payments, we will also be receiving our regularly um, funding amounts. That's correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. I just want to mention um, to the public, each board member did receive this binder with all kinds of great uh, reading information with a lot of inf uh, numbers that support what uh, Ms. Wu just presented to us. Um, Ms. Wu, for the public, is there an electronic version for them to access? Yes, we will post it in our website. Um, in the business service department, we will post the second intern report. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Wu. Um, with that, I'll entertain a motion in a second. So moved. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? I, I, I just wanted to mention, um, you know, the slide that, um, that you put in from last summer's three-year projection that showed an almost $15 million deficit is stark. It's shocking. I remember seeing that over the summer and um, it's incredibly impressive, the job that you and your department have done to move a $15 million, almost $15 million deficit to um, a, a, a positive balance. So thank you for that. That's, I, I know that was a, a terrifying time for me to consider that and maybe maybe for others also, and to be where we are now, it's truly amazing. And I thank everyone who has been involved in making that um, making that happen. Thank you, Ms. Lockerbie. Um, with that, Ms. Huff, can you call the roll, please? Board Member Golar? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board Member Hammond? Yes. Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board President Trevanti? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Wu. And we'll move on to tech technology, Charles Provokin. And that would be the addendum to agreement with Crown Castle Fiber for ISP upgrade. Yes. Uh, good evening, President Trevanti, board members, cabinet members of the community. The Board of Education is requested to approve an addendum to our agreement with Crown Castle Fiber for ISP services uh, to upgrade our bandwidth from three gigabits per second to five gigabits per second. Uh, Pre-COVID-19, our bandwidth usage was under one gigabit per second. With hybrid learning and live streaming around the corner, I'm projecting bandwidth usage to be in the 3.5 gigabit range, give or take, during peak hours. This will support the simultaneous video conferencing of all teachers, as well as support video conferencing in the learning pods, um, as well as the applications that they use, such as Google Classroom, um, Google Drive, Google Docs, Nearpod, and all the great stuff that they do. Um, please note that this will not uh, support um, everybody using Zoom. Um, you know, students in the classroom would be viewing the, the, the live instruction that, or, or doing small group uh, within the classroom. Uh, this upgrade will increase the monthly contract cost from $2,400 a month uh, to $3,000 a month uh, before E-rate reimbursements. Um, after E-rate e reimbursements, our monthly cost will increase from uh, $480 to uh, $600 per month. And I just want to note that uh, moving forward with this upgrade, uh, we would be paying out of pocket the difference until E-rate kick in. 
kicks in. Uh, E-rate will kick in at July 1st uh, uh, with the next E-rate cycle of uh, 2021. Thank you, Charles. Any questions for Charles? I do you have a quick question? Um, assuming the board passes it right now, when will it be effective? When mm -hmm. will it be implemented? What I guess I'm looking at the timing of when our hybrid um, plans go into effect. Uh, I already initiated uh, for them to uh, start the process uh, a couple weeks ago. So it's supposed to be 30 days from that. That So I anticipate in the next two weeks that it will be uh, act, uh, active. Um, and there's also you know, pending board approval as well. Um, so I am moving to just install and, and have that activated as soon as possible. But typically there was a 30 day uh, turnaround for this. Okay, thank you. Um, can I entertain a motion in a second? So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion in a second. And Ms. Huff, can you go ahead and call the roll please? Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board Member Hammond? Yes. Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board Member Golar? Yes. Board President Trevanti? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. All right, thank you very much. And I believe you're still up, uh, Charles, with the award contract to the experts for E-rate basic maintenance. Yes, uh, the Board of Education is requested to approve uh, this E-rate basic maintenance proposal and award to co a contract to net experts contingent upon E-rate approval. This contract will allow a district to perform basic maintenance of our network infrastructure as deemed eligible per, per E-rate rules. This includes repair or replacement of aging fiber optic cabling copper and copper cabling as it becomes damaged um, over the years, as well as the replacement of our battery backup systems as they, they break down. Um, with the, their life cycle. This also includes basic maintenance of our network programming as well. Uh, the contract amount is not to exceed 114977 uh, 94 cents for three, over three years. Uh, then the district, district anticipates E-rate to cover 80% of this. So the amount uh, would be the balance uh, not to exceed $23,000 um, over three years. Um, this is a use as needed type of contract. So if by any chance nothing breaks down over the next three years, we won't use it. Um, but if for whatever reason, um, an incident that happened a couple of years ago where um, rodents had a um, Christmas Eve feast at Santa Fe and chewed up some of the fiber optic, this will allow us to repair that fiber optic at an 80% uh, discount covered under E-rate, uh, 80% covered under E-rate. Any questions for Charles? Rob? Just real quick, Charles. Um, what is the percentage of life left in our infrastructure? Um, it depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about fi our fiber optic, our fiber optic was put in around 2001, 2002, 2003. And typically folks put about 25 year life on that. Um, so that's kind of uh, where we're at with that. Um, many districts, quite honestly, have already replaced that fiber optic infrastructure. Um, however, uh, what happened at, at Monrovia um, was that the CTO at that time, he actually put in very top of the line fiber optics. Um, he must have got a good deal or something. I don't want to speak for him, but he, he put in really good stuff back then. So, um, you know, I'm hoping that it will real, realize its 25 years uh, typical lifespan. Um, but things do happen. Most of the breakage have been due to rodents or, you know, un unusual circumstances. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Ms. Lockerbie? Thank you. Um, you had mentioned pending E-rate approval. So, and I understand that E-rate E-rates approval is different for different things at different times under different circumstances. So if we were to approve this item tonight and E-rate didn't improve the maintenance with Nexperts, 
what situation are we in? Um, the situation we would be in is that if something were, were to break, um, I wouldn't use this contract. I would just do a, a separate RFP or bid um, to repair, repair that item. Okay. So um, this is just kind of a, think of it as a master contract for three years um, as a vehicle, uh, a way for me to use E-rate funding to repair our infrastructure should it, uh, it fail. Um, and then also, and I'm, I'm still working on completely understanding how E-rate works. So thank you for your patience with my questions. Um, if we initiate something with E-rate, because it's a certain percentage for a certain amount of time that we're allotted by them, correct? That's correct. So... If we say we're going to go into this contract um, and we want your approval on it, will they um, earmark the, um, the benefits that they would offer to us and then would we not be able to get them back? Uh, yes and no. How, how it works is um, we are on, we, basically we get a five-year bucket and our bucket has just started. We started because the last cycle, the last five-year bucket ended last year. So we have roughly seven hundred thousand dollars. So they basically one hundred fifteen k would be earmarked for this. Um, the tech, the the term that they use, accounting term, is encumbered. Um, if I don't use it, the money goes back into that pot. Okay. Um, so this is a contract for three years. If I don't use the full 115K, it goes back into the pot. Um, but then I have two years left to use it because it is a five-year uh, bucket. Great. Thank you so much for that explanation. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can I have a motion and a second? So moved. We have a motion. Second. I'll second it. Okay, thank you. We have a motion and a second. Ms. Huff, can you call roll, please? Board Member Hammond? Yes. Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board Member Golar? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board President Travanti? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Charles. Appreciate it. And thank you, Ms. Huff. Uh, next in action items, we have board, some, well, board business. Dr. Terosian on the California School Boards Association, CSBA, Dele Delegate Assembly Election, Subregion 23A. Thank you, President Travanti. Members of the board, you have an opportunity to uh, select your delegates uh, to the California School Boards Association. Uh, for your consideration are two uh, incumbents, and you may select no more than two. <laughs> so it, it really is um, uh, for your consideration whether or not you would like to submit this ballot on behalf of the Monrovia Unified School District, endorsing the delegates Susie Abadjian from South Pasadena and Jennifer Freeman from Glendale. I'm good. Any discussion? Any No. All right. Well, we'll need to. Um, do you guys want to vote on this? Yes. No. We're going to skip it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Moving as, on. Uh, yes. As board member number five uh, Hammond would have said, it just died of loneliness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. We will move on to board discussion to, oh no, we already did that, gosh. All right, we will move on to item number eight, professional services agreement with executive search firm leadership associates. Um, I do wanna give for those still tuned in this evening, provide a little background. We did have a special board meeting this last week in which the board interviewed three uh, separate firms for a potential contract um, for the executive search firm to replace Dr. Turozian um, in her position. Uh, 
we were hoping to meet with a, a fourth firm, but they did pull out. They recused themselves, and I can only imagine it was probably because they had just been retained by a nearby district. It would have been a conflict. Um, so at this time, the, the board did ha ha deliberate in public in that special board meeting and did make the decision to go forward with, with leadership associates. We felt they were the strongest um, firm of the three interviewed, but uh, now we need to vote on the actual contract and if that's the route we want to go. Any questions regarding this item? Uh, oh, Celine. Okay, you look like you wanted to say something. I, so, I did. I wanted to oh. ask a question. Okay, because um, I was the descending vote on going with this firm. Uh, I don't know how to ask my question. Um. I'm not going to ask a question at this moment. <laughs> it's late. It's late. I get it. All right. So then um, can I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? Ms. Huff, can you call the vote, please? Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board Member Golar? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Um, as I had mentioned in the last meeting, um, I did not want to go with this firm. And I mentioned publicly why the reasons that I didn't want to go with this firm. Because this is the choice that has been made by um, the majority of the board, I am going to vote yes for this agreement, but I did want to mention for the record that um, why I had, um, why my um, votes were different from the last meeting about this to this meeting um, and why they're different. So yes, thank you. So noted. Board Member Hammond? Yes. Board President Travanti? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Ms. Huff. We'll move to um, an item we had pulled from consent, and it's the policy 5144. Will you be taking Thank that one, Dr. Trozian? Yes, I will. Thank you, okay. Board President Travanti, members of the board. We'd like to make a slight uh, addition to the proposed changes in the board policy in terms of upgrading them and updating them. Uh, what we'd like to do is add to the list of um, areas for professional development uh, to include uh, sensitivity training in the following areas. And we'd like to add gender identity as, uh, as well as uh, gender. So gender is already included. We'd simply like to add gender identity as part of that list of potential professional development. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Terosian. Any questions or comments? We'll bring that to, to a vote or, I'm sorry, motion and a second, please. So moved. Second. All right, Ms. Huff, the roll, please. Board Member Golar. Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board Member Hammond? Yes. Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board President Travanti? Yes. The motion carries 5-0. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Terosian, pending board issues. Thank you, Board President Travanti. Very quickly, uh, while everything is self-explanatory, we will add the note about the PBIS update for um, of future months. Thank you, Dr. Terosian. And under old business, March 24th uh, will be our regular, our next regular Board of Education meeting, April 10th, uh, regular Board of Education meeting. And a new business, um, I'd like to uh, 
entertain setting up a special board meeting uh, this Friday uh, to go ahead and vote on the, the new hybrid plan for elementary schools. And do we have a consensus of one o'clock? All right, so that thumbs up on there. Okay, so that'll be a special board meeting to vote on uh, the, the, sorry, I'm tired, high flex um, elementary model. And um, it's important that we go ahead and weigh in on this because the, um, they have a timeline for implementation. We wanna make sure that they can adhere to that and that parents, teachers alike can make arrangements and plan ahead. So let's get that on the books for Friday. Open houses, Clifton Middle School coming up March 22nd, Canyon uh, Oaks and Mountain Park, March 25th, Canyon Early Learning Center, March 25th, Monrovia High School, March 29th through April 1st. So they must be spreading that out and Monroe, April 1st. Other dates to calendar, LCAP meetings in English and in Spanish uh, begin March 17th. And there are three times, 10 a.m., 1 p.m., and 6 p.m. There's a professional development day, pupil free day on March 19th. Cesar Chavez day, all sites will be closed April 2nd. And spring break, all sites will be closed April 5th through the 9th. So at this time, we are. Hey, oh, you're I'm sorry. One thing. Yes. Um, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Tarosian. Um, if we can, before Friday, send out a notice through Parent Square or any other, other communication forms that we have, that we will be taking action at a special meeting on Friday in the afternoon. This has been a hot button, and I don't want it to appear to anybody that we are now moving it off of a regularly scheduled time and a regularly scheduled day in order to implement it. I think um, in full transparency to everybody, we should do whatever we can to inform the public that we're going to be taking action on this at one o'clock prior to Friday. So that leaves tomorrow. We need to send that thing, we need to send it out so that people who are interested can either send their points of view in or tune in to, to watch that. I think it's very important. Thank you, Rob, for being mindful of that. Absolutely. We should be very transparent about that. It just so happened to be brought up at 11.20 p.m. But Right. And we need to send it out today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ms. Anderson. Were there any other uh, additional uh, special board meetings that we needed to calendar at this time? Um, yeah, thanks for asking that. We actually do, uh, now that we have passed the uh, contract with Leadership Associates, we will be holding a special meeting next Tuesday evening um, with, with Leadership Associates, and then we'll begin that process of, um, you know, their timeline that they had. So that's the initial meeting that we'll have with them. So thank you, Jennifer, for reminding us of that. It is Tuesday evening and I believe we said six o'clock or six thirty. It's six. Six o'clock. Thank you. And if there isn't anything else, thumbs up. We'll adjourn this meeting um, at eleven twenty one PM. Thank you everybody. Appreciate you. Have a good one. Get some rest. Everybody. Anybody want to have breakfast? <laughs> Bye.